at the end of the day, what's going to drive the Fed in the next three months to September is inflation. The hope would be, of course, that rate cuts would be forthcoming. We do think that that's going to happen and that inflation will moderate. You can't really signal that rate cuts are coming until they get another, at least one more good inflation report. I think what will cement September is really another round of data and more importantly, what we see in terms of the inflation data. They're planning to cut. They are reluctant to cut because they know how insidious inflation can be. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Let's get your trading day started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg surveillance starts right now. Your equity market negative on the S&P 500 by a tenth of 1%. The S&P, the daily winning streak stretching to day seven. That is the longest stretch of the year so far. Can we add some more weight to it? The fate of this market in the hands of this right here. Your lineup is absolutely Packed. This is what it looks like. 6.30 Eastern Time. Numbers drop from Delta. Two hours later, CPI in America. A read on U.S. inflation. And then, Lisa, for many people, the bigger one might be later on this afternoon. 5.30 Eastern Time. The president holding a news conference. I thought you were going to say, let's get your week started, because in some ways, the week begins today. It is going to be really important. I think CPI, a lot of people are looking at as sort of determining the threshold as to whether the Fed is basically locked in for a September rate cut. We heard from Fed Chair Powell yesterday. But really, at 5.30 p.m., I got to give Amory a bone here because truly that is going to set the tone for a race that has been more unexpected than many people had imagined. AMH in Washington, D.C., joining us in about 10 minutes time. Look out for that conversation. It was another bizarre day in Washington, D.C. Let's just go through some of the headlines together. On the record, I'm for Joe. That's what the Senate Majority Leader's got to say, Chuck Schumer. Off the record, behind closed doors, apparently, according to Axios, he says he's open to replacing Kim. It gets even more bizarre. Former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. The president comes out and says, I'm the nominee. I'm not dropping out. And Pelosi says we've got to wait for him to decide. It's almost sort of like childlike stuff, right? If you don't like the answer you've heard, keep asking a question. OK. It I listened to this several times, actually, this interview, because I really wanted to understand whether there was any other way of interpreting what she said other than she just doesn't want to say, please leave the race. There were a number of things that I took away from it. First of all, she wasn't throwing her support behind him. That was clear. It was in response to the question, do you support Joe Biden to remain in this race for president? She said, I support him for making the decision that he wants to make. And then the host said, well, he made the decision. And she said, we just all love him and hope he makes a decision. <laughs> a different decision. Exactly. So that these the are the times and dates in the diary now. So what we're looking forward to is a new conference a little bit later. The bar is super low for that. We saw the announcement yesterday, NBC, there's going to be an interview on Monday here in the United States. I find it interesting that we've pre-announced that on Wednesday, yesterday, looking ahead to Monday. I just wonder if they're just trying to push this off. Just say, just wait till Monday, just wait till Monday. You get closer and closer to the Republican convention. You hope that President Trump gets back in the news cycle, announces a VP, and this all goes away. Fact of the matter is, this has been in the news cycle for a long, long time. It's not going away. I was reading yesterday about why there seems to be uh, this sort of coalescing around Joe Biden by a lot of Democratic officials, even though in private, a lot of them are very concerned about their chances about being reelected. Re and it's not so much just falling in line and blindly following as much as if he says, I am not going to drop out period, full stop, and it is his decision to make, do they do more damage to their chances of getting reelected and to the party by simply going out against him and speaking their mind? And that's sort of the calculus that an increasing number of people are, are, are basically making. The dam is breaking, though. You've been saying that George Clooney reiterated some of that in a, New York, in a Washington Post op-ed. The dam is breaking because it's gotten to the point where people are feeling desperate and they feel like this is somebody who is quickly deteriorating. So I never thought I'd sit here and be talking about George Clooney. <laughs> Typically, like the rest of you, I'd put no weight on this whatsoever. But actually, it was refreshing that someone who's actually seen the president behind closed doors actually said what we can all see in public repeatedly and saw in the debate a few weeks ago. Basically saying, we saw in the debate a guy who I saw again in private during one of these fundraising campaigns. It's not an anomaly. And that's essentially what he was saying. When people talk about the elites versus the rank and file of the Democratic Party, there isn't really an apparatus in the Democratic Party for the rank and file to really speak 
other than some of these donors, et cetera. And so you have to go to the polls. And when you talk to Democratic officials, they say, we don't believe in the polls. We're trying to change the polls. It becomes a sort of tautology that is very hard to get your hand around. Quite a day we've got lined up for you. It starts in about 25 minutes when we get those numbers from Delta. This is what the price action looks like. Let's start with the scores on the equity market on the S&P 500 coming into Thursday at record highs. Equity futures pulling back just a touch. We're down a tenth of one percent. Yield to lower by a single basis point. The 10 year 427.63 and the euro stronger for a second session 108. 48. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Russ Kostrick of BlackRock as the S&P 500 winning streak rolls on. Ed Mills of Raymond James with mounting pressure on President Biden to step aside. And Michael Pond of Barclays with US CPI data on deck. We begin with our top story, another record high for US equities and another warning. Russ Kostrick of BlackRock writing this. On the equity side, we have moderated our overweight position, particularly some of the high flyers where positioning has become more crowded. Russ joins us now for more. Russ, great to catch up. We've got a lot to work through, including CPI 8.30, but let's just get into that call. What prompted the change of mind? And when we talk about the high flyers, is there anything beyond NVIDIA? What kind of names are we thinking about? Good morning, Jonathan. So, you know, look, I, I should say at the beginning is we are still overweight stocks. And I, our base case is still that equities will end the year higher than they are today. We have taken some chips off the table, and I think there are a couple simple reasons. First of which is you have a lot of good news discounted in. We expect a strong Q2 earnings season, including for many of those high flyers. But the main point is that crossbar has been raised and expectations have become very high. Even when you have a beat and you have strong guidance, you can still see some disappointment as some of these trades around, whether we're talking about semiconductors or some of the other areas that are very geared to the AI trade, have just run an incredible amount. So, Again, I think there'll be an opportunity getting these names as we get through the, the back half of the year. But we are in a point where it's going to be a little harder to beat and to impress the market than it was six or nine months ago. So, Russ, just to be super clear, this is an earnings call. It's not about the incoming data, what's happened at employment, what might happen with CPI later, how the Fed's going to respond to it. This for you is about earnings. I think it's a sentiment call, the way I'd frame it, because I do think the earnings are going to be strong. We're confident a lot of these companies are going to continue to beat and guide higher. But again, the crossbar has gotten really, really tough to go over. And when you have comp companies and, and stocks that are up 30, 50, 70 percent in a short period of time, what they've got to demonstrate to investors becomes very hard to beat. Russ. I'm trying to imagine what this look call looks like in a practical sense. Is it basically sell NVIDIA, wait for it to fall 20 percent, and then buy it in those two months where it falls 20 percent? Is that basically the call? I wish it was that simple. I think there are a couple of things to say right now. I mean, one of which is when you go beyond the, the stock price, also thinking about how can you wear your exposure? One thing that is very cheap right now, and there aren't as many given how far the markets run, is volatility. Uh, we still have a market where realized volatility over one month is in the bottom percentile we've seen over a number of years. So one of the things you can do, again, it's not just a matter of you sell it, you try to buy it back. Can you take some of the exposure off the table by selling some upside, by thinking about stock replacement, owning the calls or a call spread rather than owning the stock outright? And what that does is it allows you to use that cheap volatility in a way that mitigates some of that downside risk. Interesting at a time when we have a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the macro backdrop and the political backdrop will be. I do want to get to CPI. You do see this as a pretty important uh, data point that we get in about two and a half hours time. Some people are saying that it will determine whether the Fed goes in September or not. What's the sort of break even rate, right? What's the sort of uh, level that we have to see in the CPI report today that would either make or break the idea of a September rate cut? You know, Lisa, I'm not sure that I would describe any number, even, you know, something's important to CPI is the number that will determine what the Fed's going to do. It's, you know, worth reminding ourselves that we're going to get two labor market prints, two non-farm payrolls between now and, and the September meeting. And those are also going to be important. The Fed has been very clear. They're looking at the labor market. They're watching for signs of moderation. So I don't think it's one number. But, you know, our view is you're probably going to come in around where the consensus is. And I think there's going to be some focus on the service component, the housing component, the parts that have been a little slower to come down. I think if you get in that ballpark of the consensus around point one on the headline, point two on the core, that's going to help solidify the case for a September cut. But again, I'm not sure that any one number is either going to you know, nail it down or, or reject it.
For the purpose of this conversation, Russ, we can make a couple of assumptions. Just for the purpose of this conversation, let's just right. say it leaves the door wide open for cuts in September and maybe beyond. Let's also assume that in the next month or so, employment continues to weaken somewhat. Cool, if that's your favourite word. I want to understand what the limits are to the rally at the long end, given the political considerations that have been percolating now for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, John, I think this is exactly the right question, because honestly, you know, the market has already gotten to the point where you're likely to cut two times this year. And I think that's probably about right. Certainly a lot closer to what we're going to see than how we started the year. Uh, but we're still in an environment where you've got a couple of things to keep in mind. The volatility of inflation is much higher than it was pre-pandemic. We have got considerable concerns about the amount of supply we're going to see in the back half of the year, 25, 26 and beyond. And by supply, I mean the supply of treasuries. So even if you get a benign print today, I still think we're in an environment where the long end, let's talk about the U.S. 10-year, is probably still in a trading range, which has been roughly about 420 to 450. That's probably a reasonable range going forward, even if we get the print the market's looking for today. Yesterday, there were $39 billion of 10-year uh, treasuries that were sold at a time when a lot of people are raising these concerns about long-term inflation and the ability for longer-term rates to come down. Given that, given the deficit, it was a rip-roaring auction. It did fantastically well. The indirect and the direct bidders uh, really increased. The proportion taken down by the dealers decreased, and it was a below-market uh, yield when it finally priced. Russ, is this noise and not signal? Well, I think any one auction is probably noise. But, you know, if you take a look at the broader, let's call it the last year, you know, we have had auctions that have tailed. We have had auctions that have not gone as well as expected. And we are realizing that the, the structural deficit we're likely to see going forward is going to be high and probably higher than we thought six months ago. So while it was a relief to the market that you had a good auction yesterday, we're going to have this come up again and again and again. And, you know, again, if we think about, we weren't talking about this three, four years ago. Uh, this is something that really has come up in the landscape over the last nine or 12 months. I don't think we're in the clear because we had one good auction. Hey, Russ, some people around this table were, just to be very clear. You know, I've got Lisa out of the corner of my eye who's saying, who, you know, me. <laughs> Russ Kostrick of BlackRock. Russ, thank you, sir. Just going through Russ's calls here, just trimming that overweight, trimming some of the high flyers. That's the equity side of things. In the bond market, I think this is really important stuff here. Even if we keep the door wide open to cuts in September, maybe beyond, even if you get weaker than expected labour market data, there is a belief from Russell and the team at BlackRock that there are limits to the bond market rally. Peter Shear was talking about this as well, and he's talking about the long end in particular, simply because the volatility of inflation is going to be greater going forward because the deficit does matter and people are going to be concerned about that. He sees a 10 year range bound between 420 and 450. Again, this is similar to what we've heard from others. My question is, at what point that gets shaken if there is some sort of significant downturn? This is basically all still a soft landing call. And that, to me, is baked into almost all assumptions that we've been hearing from guests, as well as from a lot of reports I've been reading. The tenure this morning at 4.28. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. It's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. It took a jury just one day to deliver a guilty verdict against Archegos founder Bill Huang. Huang was convicted of 10 out of 11 counts against him. That includes fraud and market manipulation stemming from the collapse of his firm in 2021. Each count carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. The judge sent an October 28th sentencing date. And a rare miss for Apple, its Vision Pro sales won't reach 500,000 units. Market tracker IDC says its mixed reality headset has yet to sell 100,000 units in a quarter since it launched in February in the U.S. The international launch at the end of June should offset the weakness and a more affordable edition, which IDC says would cost roughly half as much and should help boost sales next year. Actor and lifelong Democrat George Clooney has called for President Biden to drop his bid for re-election. He was writing in a New York Times op-ed saying that one battle he cannot win against the, is the fight against time. It's devastating to say, but the Joe Biden I was with three weeks ago at the fundraiser was not the Joe Biden of 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. He was the same man we all witnessed at the debate. Clooney had headlined a fundraiser last month that raised $30 million for Biden's re-election campaign. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Hey Danny, thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes time. We'll see if we see that same man a little bit later on this afternoon. AMH will be in that room in Washington, D.C. More from Anne-Marie in just a moment. Up next on the program, pressure mounting for President Biden.
He has said firmly this week he is going to run. Do you want him to run? I want him to do whatever he decides to do. And that's that's the way it is. That's what a non-answer sounds like. More on that in just a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York, welcome to the program. Long, long day ahead. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. We're down about a tenth of 1%. Yields unchanged, 427.82. Under surveillance this morning, pressure mounting for President Biden. Does he have your support to be the head of the Democratic ticket? As long as the president has, the pres- it's up to the president to decide if he is going to run. Uh, we're all encouraging him uh, to, to make that decision uh, because time is running short. He has said firmly this week he is going to run. Do you want him to run? I want him to do whatever he decides to do. And that's, that's the way it is. OK, pause. This was the most bizarre exchange. I think I've ever seen on news before. This is absolutely ridiculous. He's come out, he's made a decision. They don't like the one he's made. So the way they're going to dance around this is by saying, we're waiting for him to make a decision. Well, okay. I, this is why I watched it three times. I'm thinking to myself, what, are, what am I missing about the answer here? There are two interpretations of this. One, that he's privately still deciding and they want him to actually come to a decision, and it's different than the public sort of response. And two, what a lot of people say, they all want him to step down, and they're saying, until you make the right decision, we're gonna keep just being very warm and encouraging and just trying to let you come to that decision that we want. Another one. Yeah. Uh, Not the one you have made already. 5.30 Eastern time, there is a news conference. You all know that. In that room will be Anne-Marie Hordern, down in Washington, D.C. Anne-Marie joins us right now. AMH, how big? is this press conference going to be and how low is the bar for the president? The bar is very low, but Jonathan, the stakes are incredibly high for President Joe Biden. Not only the journalists in the room that have questions for him, every single Democratic lawmaker is talking about this press conference as if this is going to be the end all and be all of whether or not he can do the job and be the nominee come November. Not to mention all the foreign leaders in the room who are talking about this on the sidelines. The fact that Joe Biden's age, the November of election, have completely eclipsed the entire NATO conference while they're here for. So every eye, not just in Washington, D.C., but I think other capitals around the world are going to be looking at this press conference to see what the president says, to see how he acts. As you said, the bar is low for him to clear, but the stakes are incredibly high. It feels like he's on political life support at this moment. Looking forward to your coverage throughout this morning. I know you've got a special guest lined up in the next couple of hours for us as well, so we're looking forward to that. Anne-Marie down in Washington for us in the nation's capital ahead of that news conference at 5.30 Eastern time. With us around this table in New York, Ed Mills of Raymond James. Ed, good morning. Good morning. What did you make of that? What was your reaction to it? To Nancy Pelosi? Exactly. So I think that was Nancy Pelosi, mother of five not Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker of the House. It was more of like, oh, are you sure you really want to make the decision that you have made? Um, And I think it was a turning point um, for Democrats because what we saw is that after the debate, clearly the momentum had built to have Joe Biden step aside. Joe Biden starts to push back. He does his interview with George Stephanopoulos on ABC and he does just well enough to stay in the race. And he starts to kind of really campaign again and then was getting support on the Hill. And it looked as if he was securing the nomination once again. And then her comments open up the floodgate. Chuck Schumer last night supposedly arguing that he's open to the ticket. For this to change, I'm looking at Pelosi having a more specific uh, statement. Jim Clyburn, who essentially gave uh, the political support to Biden. Uh, and a couple of other Democrats have to be the ones that come out and tell Biden that he has to step aside for Biden to step aside, because in his ABC interview, he said they would never come and ask him to do that. If that changes, his conversation with the media also has to change. Before we get there, it was sort of an interesting dynamic. One of the reasons why we saw the floodgates of Democratic officials coming out and speaking out about their desire for Joe Biden to step aside was curtailed because of NATO. 
And it was sort of this belief, let's have NATO, let's make it sure it's okay, let's make sure that the U.S. has a strong point, and then we'll figure it out afterwards. It seems like the cat's out of the bag. We're hearing NATO leaders basically going to talk with Trump advisors to basically hedge their bets because they see that as a more likely uh, outcome. How much is the floodgates, are they sort of shifting way beyond what you would have expected to really get this going in a sooner time frame? So I, I think I was surprised by Pelosi's comments yesterday. Um, I think NATO is an important uh, point you know, to have the NATO conference in D.C. to allow Joe Biden to continue to lead the country, lead the world is important. But the problem for Democrats is the timing is really short here. We have a ballot deadline in Ohio that's on August 7th. And so if you are going to make this change, you're going to probably have to make it before the actual physical convention and probably do it in an online convention. And so part of the question I have is how much of it is a strategy by the Biden campaign to just delay things long enough where if we get past the NATO press conference today, past the Lester Holtz um, you know, interview on Monday, if we have Trump nominated next week, um, will there be a push by Democrats to move up that virtual convention to the week after the Republican convention and shut down any question whatsoever on whether or not Biden is going to be the nominee? There have been some inquiries into why the people around Joe Biden have kind of kept his condition quiet, why we haven't heard more about this earlier and more vocally. Do you think those are legitimate lines of inquiry? When you are the president of the United States, that is a very legitimate line of inquiry. You know, generally speaking, the president of the United States has to be available at all hours, uh, should be available to have unscripted events. It is pretty striking that we're all focused on a 5.30 p.m. press conference where it's not that many questions that you get at these press conferences whether or not he's able to clear that bar. Uh, it is not unusual to have a sit-down interview with an anchor from a TV station uh, as a, ooh, we all have to watch this moment. Uh, so we have changed our kind of general bar for what it is to be president. Um, we have not had a press conference at the White House where Joe Biden has stood there for an hour plus taking all questions. If he could do that, why hasn't he done that is a very legitimate question for all of us to be asking. The three pressure points. You've mentioned one party officials. There are two more donors and the polls. What are you hearing about where donors are? And what are you seeing in the polls right now that might change his mind? So, John, I think if this was 20 years ago, it would be a completely different conversation about money. Um, the folks that donate to campaigns has really broadened out. And so what we've seen from the Biden campaign is actually really good fundraising, uh, especially since the debate. And that is a lifeline for this presidency. If it was 20 years ago before we really saw this level of online fundraising, fundraising would have already dried up and that would have been a huge pressure point. But that flow of funds from small dollar donors is allowing Biden to stay on. And then on polls, I think we've had so many polling errors, not only here in the United States, but as recently as last weekend in France, that that gives the ability for Biden to say, I don't believe those polls. And if you look at Biden's track record, every time he's been on the ballot in November, he's won from Senate to vice president to president. He's on a winning streak that he doesn't think he's going to stop. And when you are someone who has won that frequently, you don't believe the polls. And I think he's really concerned that if he steps aside, is there time to put together the campaign to go against Trump? He's sticking in. We've got 30 seconds. Ultimately, what's the call from you? Does he step aside? Um, if we see a poor performance, absolutely. But I think it is his, in only his decision to make. He has the delegates. Uh, I think as of right now, he's more likely than not to be the nominee uh, for Democrats this November. Ed Mills of Raymond James. Ed, it's good to see you. Likewise. Thank you, sir. Coming up on the program, we'll catch up with Michael Pond of Barclays. He's counting it down to the latest read on U.S. inflation in about two hours from now, with some considerations as well about what this race ultimately means for inflation. I think there was a note from Michael Pond in the last couple of weeks. Can, can Trump make tips great again? Yeah, basically the inflationary impulse from some of the policies that we're expecting potentially with tariffs, lack of immigration, etc. This is what a lot of people have been saying. And then other people say, eh, ignore the noise. Ignore the noise. Is it noise or is it news? Keep going back to this. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative by a tenth of 1% from New York. Good morning.
Equity futures on the S&P 500 are negative by 0.1%, just a little bit softer here in the equity market. Likewise on the Nasdaq, we're down by about a tenth. On the Russell, down by a tenth also. Going against the grain of the last week, that's for sure. Seven days of gains on the S&P 500, the longest daily winning streak of the year so far. And it had been sort of inching up, coughing and wheezing, as we said yesterday, to new record highs. Yesterday's was different. It had a little bit of pep in its step, 1% gain, which is the biggest in more than a month. And you saw this pretty much across the board. This is the key question. Are we starting to see the broadening out as people move away from the high flyers, but not really move away from them, just sort of, you know, start to look at other places too? Basically, in short, every single industry group on the S&P 500 in positive territory just yesterday. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Lots to talk about here, particularly on the supply side. Had a guest just moments ago in the last 30 minutes, Russ Kostrick of BlackRock, who said, basically, even if you get softer inflation, softer employment numbers, there are limits to the rally at the long end because of the amount of supply that's coming, Lisa, over the next year and beyond. And we've heard this. Basically, the range that we expect 10-year uh, treasuries to uh, trade in is something like 420 to 450. This is Russ's view. I think that there's some other people out there, including uh, Peter Scheer, who are sympathetic to that view. Key question to me is, at what point do we see a real growth slowdown that kind of gut checks some of the concerns about the deficit. And we've heard that again and again. It's just as uncertain. So maybe this is more of a near-term call until we get maybe a little bit more visibility in the fog of 2025. Looking for that sign of slowdown, you won't just look for the economic data, you'll look for earnings as well. In just a moment, we'll go through the Delta numbers. They dropped just moments ago. Lisa's on top of that. I just want to switch to foreign exchange just briefly. Take a quick look at what's happening with sterling. GDP was better this morning. The pound is stronger. We heard from the chief economist to the Bank of England yesterday, Mr. Pill coming out and basically saying, throwing some cold water over the prospect of a cut anytime soon. All of this highly dependent on where inflation comes in. So sterling getting closer to 130, 128.76. If you're Rishi Sunak, you've got England in the final this weekend. The data's better. What were you doing? calling for an election in early July, but we'll save that question for another day. As I said, Dow to just drop in moments ago. Lisa, what have we got? Basically, the forecast is lower than expected, in part because they see capacity decelerating in terms of how much is growing into the second half. They're talking about uh, something like $170 to $2 for the earnings per share for third quarter. The expectation was $2.04. They see the passenger revenue at $13.8 billion versus the estimate of $13.9 billion. Meanwhile, when you take a look under the hood, they have been beset by a huge host of costs, whether it's some of the labor uh, discussions that they've been having, whether it's equipment maintenance at a time when demand is still there. But the question of how much can they jack up prices really becomes relevant. I'd like to dig a little bit more into these numbers to really understand the breakdown between domestic and international travel, because that has been basically the dividing line for quite a long time. Take your time. We'll come back to this. We'll be on top of this story throughout this morning. The number the stock is down in the pre-market by about 6% at the moment. So just pulling back on Delta Airlines in early trading. Let's get you some top stories elsewhere. Under surveillance this morning, Axios reporting Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is privately signaling he's open to replacing President Joe Biden as the Democratic nominee. Schumer telling Bloomberg News, I'm for Joe, without further comment. We've seen this repeatedly over the last few weeks. What they tell you on the record is very different to apparently what they reportedly say behind closed doors. The calculus is common complicated because on one hand you have people who are seeking re-election in the next couple of years democrats who see it as political liability to not say something as you've pointed out this is actually a very odd kind of pull a career risk on both sides and on the flip side you have a number of democrats who are thinking if we don't back joe biden and he doesn't leave the race we are ensuring that donald trump is the president donald trump on his side uh, reportedly is excited about the idea of facing off with joe biden as there is so much dissent in the Democratic Party, and people are talking about a landslide win by him. These are some of the calculuses underpinning some of the rumors that we're hearing as the leadership starts to test out, really pushing back on Joe Biden. So we just settled this with a game of golf, ESPN pay-per-view, something like that would help out Bob Iger. He'd be happy with that, too. Can you imagine? Is, it, is the club going to have AI on it so can, that, you know, you a little that? robot can kind of do it for them? Seriously, though, how many people would pay to watch that? It's true. I, mean, I would pay serious money to I'm watch sure that. I'm sure you would. And you know what? It's not going to happen. So it was watch eight hack, one of them sort of hack it around 18 holes of golf. Anyway. Who do you think is going to be worse? Yeah, I think we know the answer to that. It's the guy who thinks he had a six handicap. OK, eight, eight. All right. After the correction, inflation's coming up a little bit later. Costco in mind. 
hiking membership fees for the first time since 2017. They held off for quite a while. A basic membership is going to go to 65 from 60. A premium membership will be hiked to 130 from 120. The new prices taking effect September first. The stock is positive by 3%. Typically they do this, what, every five years or something like that. This one was overdue. And that's what a lot of people who are investors in the company have been saying. Just to put this in perspective, it affects about 52 million memberships. That's the reason why we care about a $5 increase or a $10 increase in the premium membership. This is a way for them to get a lot of money. At the same time, they've been gaining share. And this has been the calculus for Costco. How much do they want to lower the bar for people to go there and sort of maybe either downscale from Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck, as Tom likes to call it, or some of the other sort of high-end grocery stores? How much are they trying to get some of uh, the wealthier individuals who want to maybe experience less food inflation than otherwise experience? They obviously think they're in a position of strength to do it. Let's put it that way. The stock is higher in the pre-market by something like 3%. Turning to the main event for the market this morning, US CPI data due in just under two hours time. Forecasters expecting consumer prices to show the smallest back-to-back -back increases since last summer, boosting the case for the Fed to cut rates perhaps as soon as September. Michael Pond covers all of this and he joins us from Barclays right here in the studio in New York. Michael, good morning to you. Thanks for having me. Are we underpricing inflation still? We still, we think so. We, the markets are essentially priced for Fed perfection. And as a baseline call, assuming that the Fed gets it right, at least over time, I think it's a good one. But the risks still seem like inflation is tilted to the upside. What is it about that you see, the pillars of that call? What are the most durable pillars of that call? Where's that inflation risk coming from? Well, as measured inflation through CPI, the, the most robust component is really the shelter component as measured via rents. So uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, new supply coming into to the rental market. Uh, but in single family rental markets, there's still a lot of tightness, again, in part because of high rates and a lack of turnover in the housing market. That means that those who would like to buy a home are left as renters. So there's very strong rental demand pushing up on rents. And so we're left with high rent inflation. Uh, despite the fact that the, the Fed has raised rates to try to slow it. Yeah, this is fascinating, Michael, because we have a lot of people who come on, they say owner's equivalent rent is a flawed metric. They shouldn't be using it. Rents on any kind of empirical basis have been basically stagnating across the country. We haven't seen any inflation. And this, this metric of uh, CPI would be a lot lower if they just acknowledge that. How do you respond to that if you still see housing inflation, rent inflation as being a real factor driving inflation going forward? Well, first on OER, methodology. Ours is not to reason why. Ours is just to understand the CPI. So it, it is what it is, and that's where the markets are. That's what the markets are priced off of. Um, but when it comes to, to measurement, I think people are overemphasizing measures of multifamily rent inflation, uh, whereas OER is a 50-50 blend between multifamily and single family. And so most of the indicators on the, the national rental market are on multifamily, and historically that's been useful in forecasting OER. But things are changing. Single family rent inflation, as, as indicated by Zillow data, is almost at 5% year over year, whereas multifamily is under three. And so if you're just looking at the multifamily data, you're gonna forecast inflation to be much lower. And I think that's why many have been missing the point on OER and getting it wrong. How much do you see uh, policy as a big piece of this? The idea that you've got the rent component on one side, and then you have this question around tariffs that, regardless of who wins, seem to be an increasingly relevant kind of point, as well as curtailing immigration, also probably a relevant point, regardless of who gets elected. How does that factor into longer-term inflation calls by you? So we're, we're, we've been hearing from clients that they think that a Trump administration will be more inflationary than a Biden administration or a second Biden administration. It's not clear to us because Biden policies of, of stimulating the economy uh, through fiscal spending have been inflationary in our view. Uh, so from a change basis, maybe they're more inflationary under, under Trump. We're getting tariffs um, either way. So it's not clear to us, but the market is saying that the consensus seems to be that a second Trump administration would be more inflationary. And given that the odds have gone up, we think the market, therefore, from a probability standpoint, should now be pricing in higher inflation over the next year. It's not. And therefore, we think that shorter end break evens are quite cheap here, just from a risk perspective. 
Are you saying that you don't think the Fed should cut rates? <laughs> we think the Fed will cut rates in September. Uh, we think that data will, will justify that, especially when they're looking at PC inflation, which has a much lower shelter weight. So we think data will, be, will come in just soft enough on the inflation data, particularly given the Fed's shift in focus towards the labor market, which we heard uh, clearly from Chair Powell earlier this week, uh, that a, a year or so ago, it was all about inflation. And unless inflation came down, they weren't budging. Well, now with the labor market weakening a little bit, they're watching both sides of their mandate. And you could have a scenario where inflation stays relatively high, not 6 7%, but stays sticky to the upside, and yet the labor market's weakened just enough that they cut even with high inflation. Okay, that's a really, really good point. So let's build on it just a little bit. What is it about the inflation forces that you see, and you mentioned rents, that are durable in the face of softer employment? How do those two things work? Well, you just mentioned earlier that uh, businesses still have pricing power, uh, with Costco and others still raising, raising prices. Um, whole, whole paycheck. We're still seeing food price in inflation, uh, especially when it comes to restaurant workers. And so there is still that, that pricing power. Uh, core goods price inflation, though, uh, is, is gone for a little while. Uh, we're seeing that come in at a relatively negative rate. You said we a little saw, while. It gives me the impression you think it's coming back. Well, it could. Look at shipping rates. If you pull up a, a chart of the Shanghai Shipping Index, uh, that's retraced over 60% of its pandemic drop. Uh, so again, during 2021, uh, a lot of the core goods price inflation was because of supply chain problems through high shipping rates. Now, that's not a, gonna impact the June print, but if that stays high and goes higher still, eventually import contracts will be reset to reflect those higher shipping costs, and that will be reflected in higher core goods price inflation. Michael Pond, super thoughtful. It's good to see you. Thank you, sir. Michael Thanks. Pond of Barclays. Great line. And some of the research from Michael and the team, making inflation protection great again. You know, sort of paraphrasing, but yeah. just wonderful. It's a lovely play on the reason why a lot of people think that inflation is going to be higher, although he kind of pours some cold water on that saying, you know, the inflation is going to be present regardless of who wins. Possibly. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Lots to talk about. We've had numbers already this morning from the likes of Pepsi and Delta. With a wrap up of all of that, with the Bloomberg Brief, here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Yep, we'll get to both of those. Starting with Novo Nordisk, though, the once weekly insulin has failed to get approval from U.S. regulators. The government asked for more information information to complete its review. Novo said the agency asked for details on the manufacturing process and the type 1 diabetes indication. The Danish pharma giant says it's evaluating the request and plans to work closely with the agency. The shares were little changed in early trading in Copenhagen, but have climbed about 40% this year, thanks to the rising potential of its obesity drug. Okay, to earnings. First, Delta, those shares falling more than 8% pre-market. It said that it expects profit this quarter to fall short of expectations. And that week or four reflecting issues plaguing the broader industry. Delta and its competitors are looking to fill extra seats during the busy summer travel seasons, while rivals are pushed to lower fares to stay competitive. CEO Ed Bastian saying that price cuts have been particularly acute for June through August. Bastian estimates that the industry capacity is exceeding demand by 3 to 4 percent. Now to Pepsi, though shares also falling in the pre-market, down 2 percent for PepsiCo. It reported second quarter profit that beat expectations yet revenue came up shy. Organic revenue in the second quarter was 1.9% growth. The estimate was for 2.9%. Demand is slipping after consistent price raises from PepsiCo, especially in North America, where revenue and volumes dropped year over year. And that's your brief, John. Hey, Danny, thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes. Just to go back to Delta, just briefly, this was the darling of the airline sector for most of this year. Before this print, the stock was up by something like 16.5%. Lisa, this name's getting punished this morning. It was expected to be sort of immune to some of the domestic trends because of its strong international uh, presence. Second quarter profit fell 29% from a year earlier. They're saying this has to do with a glut of seats in the U.S. The capacity has actually gone up faster than the demand has, particularly on the domestic side. Also, higher fuel costs. Also, something they didn't talk about, some of the labor we 
negotiations have also taken a crimp out of it. What I think is interesting, over half of Delta's revenue now comes from sources such as its loyalty program and premium ticket sales. Credit card companies. Yes, and that, I think, is a really important point. That is bolstering them. Raises questions, what about the other airlines? And I expect them to possibly see a more damaging outlook. It's the point you've made repeatedly, Bramo. American Airlines already having a tough year. This is spilling into the rest of the sector. American is down by about 3.7%. United down by about 3.3%. Up next on this program, allies looking for leadership. We in Europe, we need to be carrying better our own weight what comes to defense and deterrence. And when Trump is saying this, and it's not only Trump, we hear this also from the Democrat camp, and rightly so, you know, then we take that seriously. That conversation, up next. Live from New York City, welcome to the program. Equity futures backing off from the gains of the last week or so. We're down by only a tenth of 1%. No drama just yet. Plenty of drama in store potentially to add today with CPI on deck later this morning at 8.30 Eastern Time. Under surveillance this morning, allies looking for leadership. We in Europe, we need to be carrying better our own weight what comes to defense and deterrence. And when Trump is saying this, and it's not only Trump, we hear this also from the Democrat camp, and rightly so, you know, then we take that seriously. And this is exactly what is happening now. We need this for our own cause, we need it for NATO, that we fortify also the European pillar of, of NATO. But I'm pretty certain that uh, Europe, who invests more into its own defense, is also a better partner and a more attractive partner to the United States. So here's the latest. NATO formally declaring Ukraine is on an irreversible path to membership once its war with Russia ends. The alliance also announcing a long-term commitment of security assistance. This is Western leaders look to shore up ties ahead of a potential Trump second term. Watching President Biden's every move at the summit, including his news conference at 5.30 p.m. later today. Down in Washington, D.C., Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, good morning. Good morning, John. And that's right. You have European diplomats watching every single move, including some aides that told us it wasn't just Biden's speech on Tuesday, but they were concerned potentially he would drop the medal as he was putting it on outgoing NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg's neck. So this has completely overshadowed the summit. And we have someone here to talk with us about this. He's the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, also former foreign policy advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel, Ambassador Christoph Hoiskin. Thank you so much for joining Bloomberg. Thanks for having me. So the elephant in the room, as you know, you've been in all the meetings, you're on the sidelines of this NATO summit is about the November election and President Biden's mental acuity. From a security standpoint, does it change the U.S. commitment to NATO, tanks on the ground, weapons to Europe and Ukraine on who's in the White House? Well, difficult to say. What is bothering us as um, you know, we are here in Washington for the summit is that um, we, we want to concentrate on the summit. We need um, you know, the NATO alliance to be strong. We want uh, the support for Ukraine going on. And when you are on the sidelines, everybody talks about the president and there are bets being placed and all this. So we, we, I think this is... Bets at the, NATO being placed. No, bets on will, will Biden, um, you know, remain or not? And if he is replaced, who will be the next? And so that's a lot of these talks instead of saying, well, how can we, um, uh, you know, commit more forces to support Ukraine? The Ukrainians are, are battling there with Russia and Russia. Putin looks at that and, um, you know, opens champagne bottles. Because that's the state of play, and this is where leader, what leaders are discussing, does that just undermine the entire security landscape? And are you hearing potentially for some of these officials that they would also like foreign leaders like Biden to step aside so they can focus on things like security? No, I don't see that. From foreign leaders just want uh, you know the elephant of the room to go out, and they want to have to know where they stand and want to concentrate on the actual work and not have it overshadowed by this non-ending debate: should the president stand or not, and and what is his next move? So we hope this, as a foreigners, we hope that we get over this as soon as possible. I was in Kiev last week. Yes. Viktor Orban was there as well, and then he immediately went to go see Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. Yes. And now this evening he's. According to Bloomberg, our reporting, our colleagues, he is going to be going to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Do you get a sense that more of these diplomats are trying to get in a room with Trump or individuals tied to Trump because they think he's going to win and they want to make sure they can fortify the NATO alliance in the eastern flank? 
Well, um, you know, it's not wrong to talk to the leader of the opposition, so to speak, and you may remember that the then Foreign Secretary David Cameron went there, and I think he also helped to get, you know, um, the former president um, agree to the big 61 billion package. So to talk to him, it's you know, is a leader of opposition, um, no, no problem. The problem is, is Orban. Orban is a nuisance value, um, and he now has the EU presidency and uses this to portray his position as EU position. So many people are mad about this guy. You know, it's a small country, um, and they are benefiting from EU membership, and they are undermining uh, European unity. So it's, it's bad. And this from a country that was attacked by Russia, you know, and, and, and uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. But um, attacked by Russia. They know how aggressive the Russians are, but somehow Orban is um, somebody manipulating his public and, and many people. But if there's going to be a, a peace settlement, if there's going to be talks... Could Orman, Orban facilitate that, given the fact no, that he's been he in the is, room with no, everyone? He is not. He is foreign minister. He is not seen as being somebody neutral who, who can who is acceptable. Um, as I said, he's a nuisance value. He cannot. We have to. We have to come to an agreement. But this agreement has to come from a position of strength. No, and, and you cannot come out of the position of weakness and say, "Please, Putin, be nice." This is not going to work. The only thing the Russians, the Soviets understood was a position of strength. When you look at position of strength, you look at hindsight of this war, the end of 2022 was actually Ukraine's best position. Today, more Ukrainians are living under Russian occupation than they were then. Was that the moment Zelensky should have went to the peace table? Well, you need two to tango. And um, Putin has always been very clear. He's clear right now. You know, he's, um, he's ready for negotiation, but on his conditions. So there is no hint that he will give up his um, um, goal. So as long as Putin believes he can win this war, as long as he believes that, um, you know, he has more staying power than we have, he, he doesn't stop. He has said that, you know. Do you think NATO should have come out with an actual invitation to Ukraine to join the alliance? I think, you know, in the long run, the only insurance the Ukrainians have and we have that we don't have, again, to invest a lot of money to support Ukraine for, from a next Russian attack is NATO membership. Because Russia, Russia agreed. There was a so-called Budapest Memorandum in 94. Mm-hmm. The, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons. And uh, Russia, Lavrov was already there, said, um, no, we guarantee your national security, your integrity, your sovereignty. And they didn't do it. So the only, you cannot, you know, you cannot trust the Russians. A piece of paper where Putin puts his signature is not valid the, the worth of paper it's put on. So you need solid support and you need, the long, you need NATO membership. Ambassador, when you look back at your time, when you were working with Angela Merkel, was it a mistake to continue being reliant, Germany, on Russian oil and gas and even expanding that to Nord Stream 2? Well, this was um, only part of the policy. Um, The most important is, and this is why I have this tough position, I was with the Chancellor when we negotiated Minsk, when we had the Minsk agreement where there was really a clear diplomatic way forward to solve the crisis. And um, Putin just destroyed everything. And of course, in hindsight, it was um, a bad idea to uh, continue to rely on, on um, Russian gas. Our friends from the Baltic countries and Polish friends all said advised against it. We had this long tradition, and I mean, we don't have the room to explain Germany, you know, the gratitude for reunification. Um, you know, Germany was responsible for 20 a million people killed on the territory of the former Soviet Union in the Second World War. So there is a lot of guilt and, and gratitude that position. But now we see clearly where Putin is headed. And the only way is a position of strength. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. John, Ambassador Christoph Huysgen, but also most importantly, he was a foreign policy advisor to Chancellor Merkel. And at the end there, he said Germany sees clearly now. Very interesting, though. It's a distraction what's going on with the president's age here at the NATO summit. AMH, good to catch up with you. Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. More from Anne-Marie in the next hour or so. Let's pull up Pfizer in the pre-market. I want to talk about this name just quickly. It is rallying. It is higher by almost 4% in early trading. And here's the headline. Pfizer advancing development, Lisa, of a once-daily weight loss pill. How do they come up with these names? Can I just say the name is Danuglipron. I mean, it doesn't, Ozempic and Dilute Nuclepron, kind of not sure exactly how you pronounce it, but basically they're planning to conduct dose optimization studies in the second half of 2024. The idea that you could potentially just pop a pill and then get skinny. Coming to a TV commercial near you, sort of like in the next couple of years. Yeah, how's that going to work? I I don't know. How would you pronounce that? I've got no idea. I'm not even going to try. Maybe it's Italian. Danuglepron. I'm not even going to try. 
Coming up next on the program, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods, Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove, Democratic Congresswoman Haley Stevens of Michigan, and Deborah Cunningham of Federated. Did you know I think the US and the New Zealand are the only markets where you can actually do commercials for prescription only drugs? Really? What has been winning is the AI fuel trade. And this is a long-term trend that's playing itself out in basics. We don't think AI is a bubble yet. There is a growth and fundamental story here. That's why it's not a bubble. The spread between tech earnings, Magnificent Seven earnings, and the rest of the market starts to compress as the year goes on. Their earnings have come through. Their earnings have been revised a lot and they have actually give or take delivered, if not beat expectations. In the near term, I think investors hunker down a bit and stay in those names. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City, welcome to the program, everybody. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now with a bit of a shake-up in the airline sector. So let's get straight to it in the pre-market. Delta getting punished. Delta Airlines is down by about 8.5%. Lisa, the headlines drop in about 30 minutes ago. Basically uh, lowering their full-year forecast, talking about second quarter of profit that slightly missed, falling 29% from a year earlier. A lot of people expecting this kind of decline just simply because the comps were, uh, were pretty heavy, but also because of their costs going up. But the reason for it is curious. It's because prices are getting cut at other airlines, so they have to compete to cut prices because capacity has gone up. Even though when we go to the airport, it seems like all the flights are full. Just trying to put it all together. Is this domestic? Is this international? They talked about the Paris Olympics and how that's crimping transatlantic demand because people want to stay away. A lot to unpack here. In a word, confusing, right? <laughs> and you. confusing for anyone that went to the airport over the weekend here stateside. July 4th holiday weekend, record numbers going through TSA. The airport's absolutely packed. The airlines, every single plane that I went on, that other people went on that I've spoken to, also absolutely packed, which I think just tells you why so many people are surprised this morning and why the stock is down so much in early trading. It raises a couple of questions. Is this not the full story? And if it is, does that mean that they're going to lower capacity going forward, which will make it A, more expensive, and B, even more crowded later on, because it's not as if travel demand is going to go down. There's also this other issue, and it goes to the heart of what we've been talking about with Boeing, with United, with the sort of turnover and staff. Staff, and that's that their heavy costs include $500 million of annual increase in just their labor spending. They also have a $350 million increase in maintenance spending. This goes to the question of the fixed costs and whether they can offset that by being a credit card company. That's the stock to watch and Lisa's whole point about them being a credit card company. True. I mean, for a lot of you, you agree, I know. It's not just Delta down this morning. It's also American, which is already having a difficult year. That's lower by about 4.5%. United as well, down by about 4 We'll see if they confirm, ultimately, what Delta is telling us this morning. That's the stock to watch. Here's the data to watch. 8.30 Eastern time. It's 90 minutes away. It's CPI in America. Once we get through that, it's on to this one at 5.30 Eastern time. The President of the United States holding a news conference as the NATO leaders convene in Washington, D.C. And typically you might say, why do I care? You know why you care after the last couple of weeks in this country. Basically, as we just were hearing from Ed Mills, the bar is three to five questions that he can answer coherently, and then that will basically reduce maybe some of the pressure, at least not exacerbate it in the near term for him to step down. Question that I have from a market perspective, there's going to be a lot of intrigue. We're going to be talking all about what the chances are, what the behind uh, doors kinds of conversations are with Democratic leaders. My question is, what is the market implication for this? Right? Do we have a sense of what a Kamala Harris candidacy would do for the discussion in markets? Do we have a sense of how seriously markets are now saying, okay, Donald Trump is going to sweep, but it's going to potentially be an all Republican sweep unless Joe Biden steps out? And if that's the case, that trade becomes that much more uh, heavily bet on. How much does this become market moving and how much guest after guest comes on and just says, it's noise, it's noise, it's noise, is it? I tell you this, I know what I'm going to do every Fed decision day. 2 p.m. Eastern time, Fed decision's going to drop. I'm going to sit here and say, we're waiting for them to make a decision. Every time they don't come, I'm just going to sit here and say, we're waiting for them to make a decision. 
What was Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House, doing yesterday? We keep going back to this. The president seems to have made his mind up. He's staying in the race. He's not going anywhere. He's made a decision. Then we had a series of party officials come out yesterday saying, we're waiting for the president to make a decision. I mean, make sense of this mess. Yeah, best, uh, yeah no, <laughs> I'm not going to. I mean, basically, there is no way to make sense of it. If you sat in a press conference with Jay Powell after they decided not to cut rates, you said... I'm waiting for you to decide how you are going to shape your rate decision this time. It would be a little bizarre. Look, Nancy Pelosi clearly was dancing around one of two things, either that Joe Biden is still actively considering whether or not to drop out or the fact that she, as the former leader of the House, doesn't think he should keep running. And either of those two things are highly damaging, and both of them just raise more questions about Joe Biden's candidacy. Anne-Marie in Washington for us this morning. We'll catch up with AMH in about 10 minutes' time. Look out for that. Here are the scores this morning. Futures are negative by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Sneak peek at a bond market action. Not much happening this morning at 4.28. Plenty happening a little bit later. More supply. We've had threes. Had tens. I think we get 30s, Lisa. $22 billion worth a little bit later this afternoon. Yesterday, the auction was very strong. The day before, very strong. Will 30s also be very strong? And is this also just simply uh, the volatility of auctions, as we heard from Co Russ Kostrick? This, to me, is interesting. How much do people care about auctions when they go well? Or do they just wait until they don't to then talk about, oi, the deficit? I think um, a certain one of us might be doing the one and not the other. I don't know, maybe, maybe. it's you. Yeah, okay, all right. Coming up, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods. We know who it is. <laughs> With stocks on their longest winning streak this year, Congresswoman Hayley Stevens amid mounting pressure for President Biden to step aside and Deborah Cunningham are federated ahead of key US inflation data later this morning. We begin with our top story, big tech sending stocks to all-time highs with the S&P 500 topping 5,600 for the first time ever. Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods writing this. We still see a land grab and a spending boom on the backbone of the AI infrastructure with valuations at high levels, there will need to be further evidence that spending does not pause. Sarah joins us now for more. Sarah, good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning. It's Are you to be nervous here. about what we might hear from some of their customers later this earnings season? I think we're still in a place, I mean, it's interesting because I saw a note that uh, I think Goldman put out on the fact that maybe they were spending too much. And I'm thinking, how do you say that right now? It's a little bit early to say you're spending too much. It reminds me of, you know, just to date myself, the dark fiber discussion in 2000 about we're putting in too much dark fiber. Well, the internet absorbed it all. So the question is, what is enough infrastructure? And I don't think we have the answer to that yet. It's just a law of large numbers problem now. To build on that, should we reward the apples? This was ultimately the Goldman call for having some big stock buyback or reward those that are investing all this money in the future. Some big, big outlays that we're seeing at the likes of Meta and other names too. I think that's a little bit just trying to split the reality of you're rewarding the companies that have a lot of cash. What they do with that cash, as long as it's not something that seems absolutely ridiculous, is still we have a lot of cash and that's where I want to be. So I think that, you know, for Apple, that makes more sense for them right now. And for the other companies, it makes sense to do what they're doing. So I don't think unless it's, you know, it's not some acquisition of something that's making no money or something along those lines. What do you make of Russ Kostrich's argument that essentially there is a very positive story to tell with a lot of these AI companies and the sort of big tech names, but sentiment has gotten so overinflated and people are expecting such big beats that in the near term, it just seems nearly impossible for them to exceed those to the same degree. Do you agree? I think this is the difficult part right now because there will come a point where all the spending on infrastructure will slow down or the delta will go negative and or you haven't got enough use cases for the other companies that are supposed to start getting more profitable on the back of AI. And I think when that happens, and I think it may happen, then you're going to start to see people really worry about valuations. I don't think that we're there yet because I think that you're still spending a lot of money, but I think that the concern will be okay, we've built in all this infrastructure, sort of like the dark fiber argument. We have all this stuff, but we can't use it enough yet. But it will get used, and it will ultimately, I think, just not sure the use cases are what we're thinking about right now. It feels like it's almost easier to speculate on whether AI is a bubble or not a bubble and what the potential is, rather than talk about the other 493 names and how hinged they are to an economic cycle that's really questionable. I want to go back to Delta. You mentioned Delta. It was supposed to be the darling of a cycle that benefited people who have the money to fly around the world and are doing so in record numbers. Is that sort of a signal to you that there is some 
fundamental problem in consumers that will percolate to a broader number of potentially consumer-facing companies. Well, I'd love to look at the release because I didn't get a chance to go through it very carefully, but is, is, this, is the problem the revenue line or is the problem the cost line? You mentioned earlier the extra costs. This has been the question about what happens when inflation comes down, do margins start to get squeezed? If this is more of an issue of margin squeeze, then it's not a problem on the economic front. It's more a problem on an individual company front because everyone's got to figure out how to deal with their costs. A lot of cost, labor costs went up in the last couple of years. Those contracts are only starting to come through. I think that's part of it. So they might be blaming it on, on cutting you know, too much capacity but having flown recently, I don't see any excess capacity anywhere. Who has pricing power right now? Where do you see that? If you can pick an industry right now, who has pricing power? We mentioned Costco earlier today putting up membership fees. Where do you see that pricing power? I think the pricing power is coming through in the technology space. I think that NVIDIA is getting better prices than they were getting before because they're the only ones who have it. I think any place where something is in short supply, you have some pricing power. And I think on the technology side, you have more pricing power. I would argue that the airlines do have pricing power, having paid for airline tickets. But I would also say that it depends on, on where you're going and it depends on the timing of that. But I think that in the in the end, any place where there is any kind of capacity constraint, you have, you have pricing power. What is it about airlines that everyone just loves to rant about? I mean, I could join you too. It's cost a fortune and it's miserable. Why is it always miserable? Because we are at a point where so many people are flying that even as they're increasing capacity, the airlines, the, the airports can't handle it. The airlines can't handle it. There's nowhere to sit. It's hot. I mean, it's, it's, I can go on and on. I remember when I was a kid, I used to go to the Midwest frequently because my family lived there. We flew on Midwest Express, which they had, you know, glass, little salt and pepper shakers and home baked. Uh, it was a very nice experience. Everything was first class and it went out of business. But you raise this question about how much you end up with cost structures that that are only now getting bigger. Do you think that people are underestimating the margin compression that we could potentially see this cycle? Because yeah, the pricing power is in NVIDIA, but it's not necessarily in Delta. I mean, it kind of is, but we thought it was, but it isn't necessarily in some of these other areas that are also dealing with fundamentally higher costs that haven't come down. I think that is, we were concerned that there was going to be margin compression earlier than there has been. So it might just be that there's a lag on that margin compression because the costs haven't really caught up yet. Everything, you know, we're such immediate people. The price changes today. We can see this today. In business cycles, things take longer. Contracts take longer to play out. It takes longer for people to figure out exactly what their cost structure is going to look like. Fuel prices have come down. That should have been of help to them. But it also might be that because they were using fuel that they'd bought at higher prices, it won't come down until the third quarter. So I think that there's a lot of rolling cost situations that we can't see because we're not those corporations. And we're looking at things from that you know, Wall Street immediacy level of, I need to know today what's happening tomorrow. And I think that that's something that is going to have to play out in the next several months. And we're starting to see whether or not that's going to happen. I don't, I don't know if Delta is a bellwether or if that's just a one-off for them. What are you more interested in today, CPI or the president's press conference at 530? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that both of them are important, right? I think that, you know, you had a guest on earlier today who said that one number isn't the most important thing. Well, it's not the most important thing unless it's goes very much in the wrong direction, right? So if CPI went very much in the wrong direction, it would be the most important thing. I think that there has been chaos since the original debate, and I don't think that that chaos is yet over. I think all of the discussions you were having earlier, I mean, none of what anybody is saying is makes sense, except tell me something I want to hear. And until I hear what I want to hear, I'm not believing what you're saying. And so that's where we seem to be. I don't know that that's going to make the press conference today is going to make that any different. I don't think to the extent, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but I don't think to the extent that, you know, it's not wrong that age is not something you can take away. Noise or news? Do you think it's real news for this market, the considerations that are percolating over the last few weeks? To the, to the extent that we've seen both of these people as president and the market has reacted well to both, I think I understand why people say whoever's president is noise. But political chaos is not just noise. And if it gets too chaotic, I think that that is going to take people's risk appetite down to some degree. But we don't know that yet, and we don't know what kind of you know, decisions people are facing right now. We know where one side of the ledger is. We don't yet know where the other side of the ledger is, even though he keeps saying he is that side of the ledger and nobody seems to believe him. We're waiting for him to make a decision, Sarah. You know that. Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods. Sarah, it's good to see you. Just wonderful. Thanks for catching up with us. Let's keep an update on stories elsewhere. There's plenty of stuff going on through this morning and throughout today. With your update, your Bloomberg Brief, here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Starting with oil, global oil demand growth slowed last quarter to its weakest in more than a year as China's post-pandemic recovery fades. That, according to the International Energy Agency, demand is on track to grow by less than 1 million barrels a day for this year and next. That slowing fuel use will be comfortably met by a flood of new supply from the Americas, according to the agency. 
Apple aims to ship at least 90 million iPhone 16 devices in the second half of this year. The tech giant is counting on AI services to fuel demand after a bumpy 2023. The company reportedly told suppliers and partners that it's targeting around 10% growth in shipments of new iPhones compared with the predecessors. And Manhattan's apartment market reached new levels of competitiveness in June. A record high 24% of leases were signed after bidding wars last month. That, according to brokerage Douglas Elliman Real Estate and appraiser Miller Samuel, units were listed for an average of just 24 days before getting scooped up, an all-time low. And renters paid a record high premium of 1.4% above lifting, listing prices on average. Rents, though, were still fairly steady for the month. The median new Manhattan lease was $4,300 changed from a year earlier and $50 more than the month prior. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Don't let them get to you. The most important number in all of that was 4,300. The median rent is unchanged over the last 12 months. Of course, the brokerage wants us to think that there's a massive bidding wars going on in New York City so we can all start these stupid bidding wars between ourselves. How do you feel about this, really? I mean, I you, you know, just saw. yeah, well, you know, I hear about all these people who don't really kind of move into the city. There's a bidding war, but rents are unchanged from a year ago. But there's a bidding war. I hate it. Are you in a bidding war? No, I'm not in a bidding war. And I won't be either. All right? <laughs> Up next on the program. Pressure mounting for President Biden to step aside. Should he, as some people have suggested, just go ahead and take a cognitive test and demand that Donald Trump do the same? I don't think that it hurt, to be honest. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, I So you think, think that he should take... I don't test. think it would hurt. That conversation up next on the program, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. You see, you remember this? Yeah. They did this with Beanie Babies. They made people think they were like bidding wars and you had to sort of rush and take them off the shelf. Beanie That's Babies. That's what they're doing with rents in Manhattan. Cabbage Patch Kids. Yeah. Manhattan Apartments. Quickly, go get one. Yeah, exactly. I've got one already, but I need another one. <laughs> <laughs> My kid's coming to me, please, I want an apartment. Yeah, in no. pink, the unicorn version. You know, like, do you remember this with Beanie Babies? Yes, That's yes. absolutely ridiculous. Yes, I remember okay. that, but, you Less know, Beanie Babies is okay, a little bit different it. Let's get back to the markets. Manhattan Apartment. Equity futures on the S&P. Can't do that with apartments. All right. We're down a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Ask the guy that bought that apartment the other day. 120 well, million. Okay, I don't think that like, this is quite the same kind of issue. More. Okay, come on. We're talking about two completely different things. 428 on a 10 year this morning. Under surveillance, pressure mounting for President Biden to step aside. President Biden and Vice President Harris are showing up with real receipts, making people's lives better. What more should he do to shut this conversation down? Should he, as some people have suggested, just go ahead and take a cognitive test and demand that Donald Trump do the same? I don't think that it hurt, to be honest. But at the end of the day, you know, I, so you think, I think that he should take a confidence? I don't think test. it would hurt. Here's the latest. Fractures deepening in the Democratic Party as a growing number of lawmakers question Biden's fitness for a second term. Vermont Senator Peter Welch becoming the first Senate Democrat to call for a new candidate on the ticket. The president set to deliver a crucial news conference later this evening at 5.30 Eastern time. Let's head to D.C. and catch up with AMH alongside Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove. Anne-Marie, good morning. Good morning, John. That's right. And Josh and I will both be in that news conference this evening. Josh, I want to get a sense from you. You're talking to the White House. You've seen how it's been with the NATO summit. Basically, the elephant in the room is Joe Biden's age and whether or not he can lead the free world. Yeah. Does the White House feel the same way that everyone is billing this press conference? High stakes, kind of a do or die moment. It depends on who you ask. Some do, some don't. A lot of people close to Biden are saying, hey, that letter we sent on Monday to lawmakers saying basically, shut up, get in line, I'm running. That stands. That is his position. We were told by sources yesterday, as recently as last night, that Biden hasn't wavered a bit in that decision to run. He's not convinced. Pelosi's sort of surprise uh, event yesterday, whatever we're calling it, however we're interpreting it, uh, has not wooed him. But there are nerves across the Democratic Party, not only in the lawmakers who are speaking out publicly, but among others who are allies of the president, that this has gained steam. I think 24 hours ago, if we were sitting here before Pelosi had spoken, Biden allies felt pretty good. And they thought, kind of thought, you know, things, things had gotten back in the bag a little bit. Jerry Nadler, for instance, had on Sunday said that Biden should probably not be the nominee. And on Tuesday had come on and said, ah, he's sticking around. There's nothing really we can do. We're all, we're all for Team Biden. And now it feels like the wheels are coming off a little bit again. So all eyes are on this press conference. If it goes 
badly, then I think we'll see more momentum towards the question of whether he should be the nominee. If it goes well, maybe they can you know, put the cat in the bag again. There's also the donor class. And the Financial Times this morning yeah. has some quotes from New York don- donors, one saying they can't believe they're saying this, but they wish there would be a gaffe tonight because something so big that he fails that he just steps aside. I want to ask you, because we heard from one important donor from Hollywood yesterday as well, yeah. who does the White House view as Brutus at this moment? Is it the Nancy Pelosi remark yesterday, putting it back in Biden's corner? Well, you made a decision, but maybe think about it again. Or was it that George Clooney opinion piece? I think it's more Clooney. And, and Clooney came with more than just his opinion, right? A lot of Biden allies said, ah, celebrities, we don't, you know, we don't listen to celebrities. We listen to real voters. But Clooney was at an event. You know, Emory, you and I were at the G7. Biden was there. He left early skipped that Ukraine peace summit in Switzerland to go to this fundraiser with George Clooney. And the video from that fundraiser was one of the ones that has really stoked age concerns in and around the debate. He looked a little out of it and kind of had to be, you know, steered off stage, handled, however you want to say it. And so Clooney came out yesterday not only saying Biden should not be the nominee, but saying that the guy he saw at that fundraiser was the same one at the debate. In other words, it isn't just the debate, it's other things as well. That and goes I, back to a Nancy Pelosi point of, is this an episode or condition? And George Clooney's opinion piece almost said, this is not just a bad night, this is a condition. Or at least there's been more than one episode, yes. And of course, one of the uh, justifications for the president's self-described bad night at the debate was he was tired, he was traveling that month twice to Europe, and that is true. I will note, you know, all eyes on tonight, it's not been a light week for him. He's hosting a NATO summit, one that's been pretty successful as NATO summits go. I'm sure he wants to talk about that. I think tonight we'll see him try to put the contrast more on Trump. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the phrase Google Project 2025 comes out of his mouth. They, re- the mouth, they really want to steer the conversation more to that, if only as a message to their own party that this is a contrast election and that is Biden's best, best path. You're in and out of the White House every day. Just quickly, I want to get a sense from you on how palatable it is, this concern. A source once said to me that worked for Bush, said anything you see in the press, it is always 20 times worse inside if it's that bad in the press. Yeah. Um, some are putting on a happy face, but the mood yesterday was, was rough. I mean, people are not jazzed at the moment, and for a range of reasons. Some of them think the media are disproportionately going after them. Some of them are mad that Democrats are speaking out, perhaps understandably. Uh, and some of them just have this deep sense of dread about all of this and that one way or another, this is wounding the Democratic brand heading into the election. Uh, it's, it's rough right now. And I think that the, for some of them who might have felt comfort 24, 48, 72 hours ago that, you know, everyone is sort of falling in line behind the president. Right now, it, it's, I think, more of an open question. Peter it- Welch is not a firebrand who pops off, you know, for, to have a senator like that come out and say that is that is, I think, indicative of wide concern as opposed to, like, Senator Romney saying something about Donald Trump when every other senator, the Republican senator, didn't agree. And just quickly, if he has this press conference tonight, why schedule and promote on a Wednesday the NBC interview Monday evening? You're the media expert, you tell me, and marie I don't know. I, I, there'll be a lot of eyes on that. Remember, that also is a, in a trip to Texas and Nevada. He's also going on Friday to Michigan. This is important. You went to the AFL-CIO yesterday. Biden is campaigning right now. He's got his you know, pedal to the floor on it, which is a signal that he doesn't intend to step aside. And so for Democrats who are coming out, they're trying to essentially pop that bubble and have him at least recognize that he, they have deep concern. But right now he is flooring it. Michigan... You know, he's speaking with black voters. He's touting support from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. He's really going to all these key constituencies in the Democratic Party that have uh, been supporters not only of the party, but of Biden specifically as a lifeline to basically save his hide here. Josh Wingrove, White House reporter, thank you so much for joining me today. John and Josh and I will be in the high stakes news conference this evening. And you talk about Biden hitting the floor campaigning. ABC, Washington Post have a new poll today. More than 56 percent of Democrats think he should step aside. Looking forward to the coverage later, guys. Thank you. AMH with Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove. I think we can all make a basic observation as to why you would announce an interview that takes place on Monday and announce it on a Wednesday. You want to stretch this out. You know that if you burn through enough time, ultimately time runs out for people to get you to stand aside. Which has been basically the strategy. If they just keep gunning it, then essentially people will have to get in line. Also, basically saying, I'm still going to be there Monday, so stop trying to wait for me to you know, drop out on Friday after the press conference. And you know how low the bar is this evening. 
super, super low. Yeah, it is. Although even that's not going to quell concerns. That's the real issue. Talk about more of those concerns up next on the program. Don't miss this. Anne Marie sitting down with Democratic Congresswoman Haley Stevens of Michigan. That conversation up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Stocks on quite a winning streak, closing yesterday at all-time highs. Coming into Thursday at a record with equity futures negative 0.1%. This is a really mild pullback on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about a tenth. The stock of the morning is Delta. We'll get to that name in just a moment. That name is down and down hard in the pre-market. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. More bond supply coming later. 30-year bonds coming to market with the 30-year yield at 447. Yields pulling back just a touch by a basis point. Just about not even half a basis point on a 10 year right now, 428 CPI coming out a little bit later this morning. I want to finish on foreign exchange, the euro stronger for a second session, the stronger it has been since early June. So in about six weeks or so, euro right now, 108.51, positive by two tenths of one percent. Under surveillance this morning, here's that name for you, Delta, delivering a disappointing outlook, expecting profit to fall short of expectations as heavy competition in the domestic market is driving ticket prices down. That stock is being driven down by that announcement. We're down in the pre-market, Lisa, by 9%. This is what we're talking about. Adjusted earnings about $170 to $2 a share in the third quarter. The expectation was for $2.04. So not a massive uh, miss when you take a look at things, all things considered. That said, we're talking about a, uh, a huge 29% decline in second quarter profit from a year earlier. A lot of questions here. How much is it because of how much the cost base has, has increased? How much is this because of fuel prices that have gone up, which they don't have a lot of control over, and none of these airlines really hedge anymore? How much does this really have to do with the ticket prices actually having to be competitive on the domestic front? And they throw in that the Paris Olympics are reducing transatlantic travel because people don't want to go to Paris unless they absolutely have to to avoid the crowds. Again, there is a mystery underpinning this, and you can see that mystery percolating out in the other shares. And of everything you just said, the one thing that made the most sense was going to Paris around the Olympics. It would be absolute hell. I mean, I wouldn't get that flight either. That yeah, makes perfect sense. But it makes me think that maybe, actually, it'll be less crowded because fewer people will be going and everybody who does go will be in the stadium. So, you know, I you don't go. know. Let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> okay, it's going to be sure. hell. We all know it's going to be hell. Okay. I think this is perfect timing. We've got CPI a little bit later this morning. It's about an hour away. Yeah. And what you're hearing there from the airline sector is just maybe some price sensitivity starting to come to the surface, some discounting. Now, I know for a lot of people that might have bought flights, airline yeah. tickets over the last few months, you may be not feeling that, but that's what's coming through in the numbers and the commentary. So Neil Dutta sent out the story about Delta and then said he put the, the headline right there and he put the first line of the story that it expects uh, profit to fall because heavy competition in domestic market and he underlined this, bolded this and made this extra, extra large drives ticket prices down. Basically, this is the disinflation that people are talking about, the consumer pushback, and you could see it even in one of the hottest sectors, the travel. Chair Powell acknowledging some of this at least, believing inflation is heading lower, but he's not ready to basically declare mission complete. The job isn't done. The question is, and this is a quote from Chairman Powell directly, are we sufficiently confident that it is moving sustainably down to 2%? I'm not prepared to say that just yet. So he didn't want to open the door completely to September. This is essentially him not wanting to tip his hand. To me, I thought it was fascinating, the sort of personal moment when they asked, what keeps you up at night? And he said, finding that perfect balance between not seeing a spike in uh, job cuts and achieving that 2% target is the number one thing that keeps me up at night, trying to make decisions that give the best chance to happen. That is the thing I think about in the wee hours. This is a Fed chair who desperately wants to nail a soft landing at a time where he is flying blind. We don't have a sense of how quickly any kind of deterioration is happening, and we don't have a sense of visibility into the inflation picture. Speaking of deterioration on the president, and a, and a serious note, and linking it to Chairman Powell, did you see what Powell said yesterday? Hasn't had a meeting with Biden in two years. Said this, I haven't had a meeting with him, he hasn't sought a meeting, and of course, I don't seek meetings. There is a kind inter interpretation here and a less kind interpretation. The kind interpretation is the president is really focused on making sure that the central bank retains its independence and doesn't have those meetings. The less kind is that conspiracy, can we even call it one anymore, that the people around the president have been maybe insulating him from having meetings with people outside of the White House? 
You know, I, I listened to that clip actually repeatedly. I really had a great, exciting night last night. Um, but I, I was listening to his answer, and he was trying to spin this as sort of a vote of confidence in Fed independence, saying yeah. that essentially this is a good thing. We shouldn't be meeting with the president. And uh, the senator was saying to him, the representative was saying to him, actually, Inflation is incredibly high. This is one of the main points. Isn't it surprising to you that he wouldn't meet with you? And the Fed chair was saying, no, we just do our thing. It does just add to the questioning. I'm not going to make a conclusive kind of statement about this because I don't know. But it just ongoing adds to the drip, drip, drip that we've been hearing all around. Yeah, Chairman Powell doesn't want to touch this subject. He's had two days of people trying and did not want to touch this. So President Biden, as you all know, is facing mounting pressure from his party to drop out of the race. The latest voice, Vermont Democrat, Peter Welch, becoming the first sitting senator to directly endorse replacing him on the ticket. Anne-Marie is in Washington with a special guest, the Democratic Congresswoman, Haley Stevens of Michigan. AMH is over to you. Thank you so much, John. And Congresswoman Mich uh, Stevens, you're also going to be in Michigan tomorrow with Biden. Yes, you're I am. You're a staunch supporter of him, and you're not backing down. Why? I'm really enthusiastic about this campaign and what we've built in Michigan. I've been rigorously on it since the beginning of the year. Detroit is at its lowest levels of unemployment in 50 years. We have manufacturing growth. I have a really popular governor, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, who's endorsed this president, who's a co-chair of his campaign, who's met with him since some of the debate fallout and is sticking by him and the commitment to stand up for women's reproductive rights, to tackle our gun violence epidemic that has hit us pretty hard in Michigan. And there's a team, right? We have built an incredible ground operation and it's hard work with persuasion voters, with turnout. I don't want to turn away from this though now. I want to keep going 15 some weeks left. Let's bring this over the finish line. And I believe and know that the Biden-Harris ticket is the one to get this done for us. Do you think he's the best candidate though? I do. You see the polling today from Washington Post, ABC, more than 56 Democrats say, six in 10 independents say he should step aside. Is it that he's the best candidate at this moment, or there's concern about basically telling a sitting president, the leader of the party, that it's time to go? Look, the stakes are high. The other thing that the polling is showing you is that people are freaked out about Donald Trump coming back what that means for young women, what that means for our economy that spiraled out of control when he was president during a global pandemic that was not well handled by him. And but polling also shows people think Trump would be better when it comes to things like the economy, which our polling shows is still the number one issue. It is the number one issue. And it's not just look at the facts today. Look, polling is absolutely important. I have to look at polling, and I have had polls that have led me down a path of success, and I've had polls that have led me wrong <laughs> before. But what I know is that people are concerned about Trump. I mean, I hear that on the ground in Oakland County, Michigan. It is palpable. People want to win. These stakes are high. Obviously, when President Biden were, was gathering his delegate votes and campaigning in, in the small primary that he had earlier this year, it wasn't 100 percent clear every step of the way that Trump was going to be the nominee. Now he's hiding in Mar-a-Lago. We don't see him really very much. I, he's come to Michigan maybe once or twice, a, a few surrogates here and there. Pretty quiet from him. And in part, we've got a president who's governing, who's leading NATO, who's got the backing of international leaders who support his plan. We have, by the way, a major foreign aid package that got done in a divided government. That's exactly what Joe Biden asked but for. But I think the concern is not so much can he lead right now. It's what does the next four years mean? And you mentioned Governor Whitmer. She was on CNN last night and she was asked, should he take a cognitive test? Her answer was it wouldn't hurt. Do you agree with the governor? Yeah, well, J Trump joked around about his own cognitive tests and, you know, that he was some super genius and was spouting off things. Look, anything the president needs to do to, to reassure people. I have been recently with him when he announced tariffs on Chinese EVs and critical minerals. I was in the Oval Office with him for an extended period of time. I haven't seen one decision coming out of this administration under his leadership that concerns me. I also know that we have got 
that a message for the next four years? It's clear people are spooked. It's also clear, though, people are united to do whatever it takes to beat Donald Trump. And we've got the campaign to do it. So we really do. You've, you've spent time with him recently. Mm-hmm. You're going to be with him tomorrow. Yeah. You said there's not a decision that makes you rethink this that's coming from President Biden, not a decision you see that concerns you. But what about his speech, the way he walks? Actual deterioration is health. Have you seen any of that? Not really, to be honest with you. I mean, look, I know I can't tell people to unsee what they saw in the debate. I, I thought he answered it honestly. Look, it's not news that he is the age that he is. Uh, I look at this and I see flawless execution from this administration. COVID relief, infrastructure dollars, not just bills that have gotten passed, but things that are being executed flawlessly, like the CHIPS Act, which is so important to our Michigan manufacturing economy, something that President Biden has championed. His campaign message is let's finish the job. There is more to do. It's promises made, promises kept. There are more things that we need to accomplish here that are on the horizon. Paid leave, funding for our public schools, support for our educators, the next generation. This is a real campaign. And and look, this is a tough moment. It's been quiet. We've had 24-7 Trump TV and his convictions and all that insanity. I don't want to go back to that. My voters in Michigan are terrified of going back to that. I mean, the, pre- the former president pretends that he supports unions, goes to a non-union shop, we worked for the UAW. But, we got the UAW endorsement. We've had this whole process here. We're weeks out from our own convention. We got to stand up to this Trump union team. Union leaders are concerned. Washington Post this morning, there was a behind the scenes meeting yesterday. Sean Fain. President Biden went and stood on a picket line with this man. He is now voicing his concerns. So when you're in Michigan and you hear from union leaders, Trump is chipping away at these people. Michigan, potentially, Biden can lose. That's what Congresswoman Slotkin even said on a recent donor call. Yeah, look, we want we want the winning campaign. And our union leaders, they're deploying uh, their members to knock doors, to evangelize this effort. And that's what you do in closed door meetings. You, you know, you do say, hey, what's our plan? How are we going to do this? We're the Democratic Party. Dis, you know, differing opinions, expression of opinions. I've had four to five Republican members of Congress from Michigan who've either left their party, impeached the former president, or got voted out. I mean, give me a break. Like, this is how it works in our party. It's a good and healthy thing. And I'm going to tell you something else that I know about Joe Biden. He is the ultimate comeback king. He's the most underestimated individual in uh, American politics. He always has been. He's got a good North Star. He's tapped into his faith. He's been through things that have tested him for this moment. And yes, he's our older, wiser president. He has not steered us wrong. And he has got a vision alongside this amazing team that he has to continue to win the future for us. Congresswoman Haley Stevens, thank you so much for your time. John, of course, that was the congresswoman from the 11th District in Michigan. Key for the president if he wants to win that state, and she'll be with him campaigning tomorrow. MH, thank you. Looking forward to more from Anne-Marie throughout this morning. Anne-Marie there with Congresswoman Haley Stevens. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Let's get to Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Costco is hiking membership fees for the first time since 2017. A basic membership goes up to $65. It was $60. A premium membership goes to $130 from $120. Those new prices take effect September 1st. Executives had said that the increase was only a matter of time thanks to strong renewal rates, new signups, and customer loyalty. Costco does usually raise fees about every five Five years. Pfizer shares this morning are higher in the pre-market, just under 2%. The pharma company announced it's making progress on its once daily weight loss pill. The drug has cleared its first hurdle in a scientific study. Now it progresses to a mid-stage study in the second half of the year. It is a promising sign for the drug maker who's been trying to break into the multi-billion dollar market for obesity medications. And it was an incredible end to England's match versus the Netherlands in yesterday's Euros. Aston Villa's Ollie Watkins scored the winning goal in the 90th minute after being subbed in and only touching the ball four times. Along with an equalizer penalty from Harry Kane in the first half, England won 2-1 and will go on to face Spain in the final in Berlin. That match Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. I'd love to see the back pages of the Dutch newspapers this morning, the sports pages. Can you imagine if this was on 
the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. Yeah, well. And the Netherlands re got that penalty that England received. What do you think yesterday. happened there? <laughs> I'm going to save my own thoughts on that matter for another day. I'm going to do like, you know, what a lot of politicians do in Washington. Yeah. What I say on the record, yeah. different to what they, you know, what yeah. I say you, behind closed doors. You could just say to the ref, do you like, I want to wait until you make a decision about that call that you made. I think the referee did a great job. Up next, Powell remaining patient. We want to be more confident that inflation is moving on a path sustainably down to 2%. Not at 2%, but on a path sustainably to 2%. That's the test we've articulated. That conversation up next, CPI, 46 minutes away. Just got a great note. The latest consumer checkpoint from Bank of America and the Bank of America Institute. This line here, it's amazing. We find a 23% year over year increase in households with in-person spending in cities across Europe where Taylor Swift has been performing. You know, in a morning where we're talking about Delta, right. and maybe struggling and you're talking about international travel and going to Paris, a 23% year over year increase in households with in-person spending in cities across Europe where Swift has been performing. Well, how many times have we heard about this? That basically it is cheaper to get tickets on a plane in a hotel and to Taylor Swift over in Germany, over in France, anywhere but the United States. And that is what a lot of people are doing who have daughters of a certain age. Yeah, the latest from Bank of America this morning. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. CPI, the next big stop for this market, 8.30 Eastern time. Equities going into it, a little bit softer. We're down a tenth of 1%. Bonds totally unchanged now on a 10-year maturity. That yield, 428.41. Under surveillance this morning, Powell remaining patient. We want to be more confident that inflation is moving on a path sustainably down to 2%. Not at 2%, but on a path sustainably to 2%. That's the test we've articulated. I have some confidence, uh, as I said earlier, that, that we are on a, a downward path. I think if you look at the data, it's pretty clear that, but we have not said though, that we have sufficient confidence and that will be a, a decision that our committee makes. So here's the latest June CPI data due out less than one hour from now. Our survey calling for another month of soft gains. Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes saying the Fed would have to see a plunge in the labor market and inflation to give it reason to move in September and risk looking politically motivated. By a slight margin, we anticipate two cuts to come in the fourth quarter after the election. Deborah joins us now for more. Deborah, wonderful to catch up with you. We have to start with that point then. Why you think the politics is so important to the decision on the horizon? Well, certainly um, that's not where the Fed likes to focus. It's, it's um, you know, timing decisions. But having said that, if it's, um, you know, kind of a 50-50 or one that could be biased in either direction, I think they'll pick the direction that has less potential political implications, which would be the November meeting, not the September meeting. The risk in that, though, that I see, Jonathan, is if they moved in November and December, I don't think that sets the stage for an every meeting move expectation in 2025. We're looking at 2025 as something that's maybe 100 basis points in cuts, depending upon what happens from inflation, what happens with employment, um, you know, what happens with GDP. But I do feel like November and December might risk the thought in the market being more than that 100 basis points, more than every other meeting. And I think that's another struggle that the Fed may be, you know, sort of deciding around that decision in, in the coming meeting. Deborah, just to cut that up into two different calls, 24, ultimately what I'm hearing are political considerations. 25, can we get into 2025? What's the dominant factor behind the call for 25. Are you expecting inflation to stay somewhat stickier than some people might expect? Are you looking for employment to hold up a little bit better? Where does it come from? I think you see weakening employment, but I don't think you 
see it falling off a cliff. And I certainly think we've now, you know, sort of pivoted from a Fed standpoint to looking at both the employment picture and inflation. For the for the most of the last, you know, maybe year and a half or so, inflation has been the name of the game. Where inflation goes is where the Fed has been, you know, dealing and and looking at, uh, you know, to decide from a, you know, from a perspective of what what their next moves will be. I think employment now comes into that picture. So inflation below three percent. Even if it's 2.9, I think that is considered uh, a confidence level for the Fed. And I think that gives them a little bit of motivation, you know, that it rounds down to two. And so it's enough. And ultimately, you know, a labor market that rather than 200,000 jobs a month is slowing to something that's more like 100,000 jobs per month is, again, something that they want. So those are the achievement goals that I believe they're looking to get to in 2025. And if they do, I think, you know, rather than 5% interest rates, 4% interest rates or high threes makes a whole lot of sense in that scenario. So let's talk about the market call on the backs of not just when they start the rate cutting cycle, but uh, how deep it goes. We've had a number of guests come on the show and say, as soon as the Fed starts cutting rates, that's going to unleash some of the six to seven trillion dollars in money market funds into other asset classes, whether it's longer duration bonds, whether it's stocks. And that's actually one reason why they're starting to broaden out their investments. As someone who watches these money market funds every day, how high is that bar for that money to go elsewhere? Well, first of all, Lisa, I think it's not uh, the the lion's share of the cash flow that has come into the product. The lion's share of the cash flow that's come into money market funds over the course of the Fed rate hiking cycle and now stability cycle has been from the deposit product out of um, out of deposit products and into money market funds by retail. That's very steady cash. That stays where it is. That's been eighty percent of the cash flow. The other twenty percent has some institutional associated with it, but also has some let's hang out in a safer market and earn 5% type of cash flow in it. And I think that's the portion that will start to move in earnest once the Fed makes its first rate cut. Um, I don't think it's a huge lion's share, but I think it's probably in the neighborhood of 10% maybe of the assets of the product. And it will likely be offset to some degree by institutional cash customers starting to pick up and increase their allocation to money funds just simply because they lag. So the wall of cash, um, as it's been called, I think is there, but in in a way that's much more muted than what the market oftentimes refers to it as. So are you saying that there's about $600 million of cash on the sidelines when you take a look at what could potentially start moving around? Not $6 trillion, as some people would say. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. At this point, there is this issue of how much this is a feasible investment, even at, say, 3 percent, even at 3.5 percent. I mean, essentially, how much is this transforming the whole concept of a money market uh, investment at a time where we're seeing rates that we haven't in a very long time? And people are kind of accepting that and starting to move more significantly. I do think that, you know, we, we're looking at something that doesn't go below 3 percent unless there is something um, in the marketplace in 2025 or 2026 that is completely unexpected and, you know, so, sort of out of control of the Fed in the way that they deal with that is by taking interest rates lower than that. So I think in a normal environment with a normal course of business in the U.S. as well as, you know, globally, you end up with a rate environment that's sticky in that three to four percent area. And that still represents pretty good value from a cash investment standpoint. Deborah, wonderful to get your views, as always. Deborah Cunningham there of Federated. Let's sit on 2024. Political considerations for the start of that rate cutting cycle over at Federated. They think November. They don't think September. They think the bar is a lot higher to go in September so that they don't look politically motivated and that you have to see a more significant deterioration in the labor market to get the Fed to really uh, have some conviction behind that call. That's not consensus. Markets right now are pricing in more than a 70% chance of a September rate cut. And a lot of people are saying that the tone that we heard from Fed Chair Powell during the two days of testimony would suggest he's softening to that view. So it's sort of this compelling moment where there's just a lack of clarity all around. Why is November a better time to go? Same week as the election. Why is that a better time to go? Base, people could say that it's because you're not necessarily trying to put your thumb on the scale ahead of an election, that you're not trying to juice, say, market action ahead of the election. That's what I would say. I think you get criticized no matter what they do.
Hey, look, I agree with you. I mean, Jay Powell has been sort of a, a lightning rod for everybody's angst about inflation and frustration with market activity that doesn't seem to cohere with a, a sort of set narrative. And uh, the reality is, you know, he, can, he has been consistent in saying we're just looking at these metrics. We can speculate, though, all we want. Tune in throughout this morning for more criticism from select guests coming up in the next hour or so. Brent Schuette of Northwestern Mutual. We'll catch up with David Kelly of JP Morgan Asset Management, Steve Rusciuto of Mizuo. It's the big one for this market. CPI is just around the corner. The time, 8.30 Eastern time. The question, will it unlock, keep the door open, wide open for a rate cut in September? After that, the focus turns political. 5.30 Eastern time, a news conference in Washington, D.C. with the president of the United States from New York City. This is Bloomberg. the end of the day, what's going to drive the Fed in the next three months to September is inflation. The hope would be, of course, that rate cuts would be forthcoming. We do think that that's going to happen and that inflation will moderate. You can't really signal that rate cuts are coming until they get another, at least one more good inflation report. I think what will cement September is really another round of data and more importantly, what we see in terms of the inflation data. They're planning to cut. They are reluctant to cut because they know how insidious inflation can be. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now. We're 30 minutes away from the big one. CPI data just around the corner. Your S&P 500 so far on the longest daily winning streak of 2024. Seven days. Can we make it day eight? Equity futures negative now by a tenth of 1%. Chairman Powell's assessment of inflation at the moment in his own words. The question is, are we sufficiently confident that it is moving sustainably down to 2%? His answer, I'm not prepared to say that just yet. Will he be prepared after in half an hour today when we get CPI, if it does come in below expectations or even meets expectations, is that enough to give him sufficient confidence to move to September? It seems as though the market is sniffing that out. It seems like that's what the market was buying yesterday. Will they be able to complete the trade today? Another data point at 8.30 Eastern time, it's not just CPI, it's jobless claims as well. The confidence they're lacking over the inflation outlook, will it be replaced by worries on the outlook for the labour market. And this is a key feature of the conversations on Wall Street, particularly over the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, with inflation going to the back burner just a little bit, relatively speaking. And we're starting to focus on unemployment, starting to inch higher. Jobless claims starting to break out. We'll see where all this stabilises, but that's one to watch at 8.30 Eastern. Especially because people don't have a lot of confidence about whether we're getting an accurate metric around this labour market. This has been an incredibly difficult labour market to understand, given the influx of immigration, given the post-pandemic trends, given all of the retirement and boomers kind of leaving and then other people getting hired. Nonetheless, if you see a market increase in a weekly jobless claims, that will shift the conversation possibly even more than a CPI print that comes in line or even slightly above. And cheat code in Washington at the moment, if you don't like the June CPI print that comes out at 8.30, just ask for another June CPI print. Okay, come on. Isn't that what they're doing in Washington is that, now? Is that what they're going to do? Basically, gonna, in Washington, that's saying, what they're doing. Is that your true CPI print? Is that how you We're really waiting for the June CPI print. We can to. do this all day. You know, the president comes out and says, I'm the nominee, I'm running, I'm staying in a race, I'm not stepping back. And then the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, comes out and says, we're waiting for his decision. We're waiting for his decision. And she wasn't the only one to do it yesterday. We saw this repeatedly. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, maybe he's still considering it. Is that really how you want to cal calculate owner's equivalent rent? Is that really how yeah. you want to understand inflation, JP? Is that your decision? Is that your decision, actually? No, look, to your point, there is something going on which raises the question of, whether Joe Biden is actually actively considering stepping down. Basically, all of these people have come out and said, no, 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 no. What is leadership going to do if they are concerned about how he performs later today? 5.30 is the later today in that news conference. Anne-Marie will be a feature of that conversation, we hope. She'll be in the room. We'll catch up with AMH in about 40 minutes. Just to go through the news conference, I think we all want to know. For the reporters in the room, is this going to be 90% on his health and 10% on NATO? Is it going to be 5% on NATO, 1%? I don't know. I'd actually like to see the sitting president talk about substance, real substance, things happening in the world. 
talking about how cogent he is, how fluid that conversation might be, and not just have this sort of shouting match about the health of a sitting president sitting at a podium in front of a bunch of journalists that feel very scorned right now and hurt by the last few weeks. I agree with you. I think especially at a time where Vladimir Putin is meeting with the leaders of India, with the leaders of Russia, there's this real question, a pretty punchy uh, communique coming out of NATO leaders talking about China and their aid to, uh, to Russia in the war against Ukraine. These are things I want to hear him speak about. No one's going to ask him particularly. And if he does, that probably won't be what we necessarily are talking about tomorrow. It raises a larger question about how much NATO leaders are looking to him for that kind of guidance and leadership that the U.S. has traditionally taken, or whether they are not, whether, as reports are saying, they are going to some of Donald Trump's uh, advisors to try to get a sense of what he would do in certain situations. It highlights why this is the main story, even when it comes to NATO. So I think it's somewhat pragmatic to talk about some of the advisors to the former president, just in case the former president comes back in November, wins in November, returns next year, and that's the government you've got to deal with. So I would say that. On your point, though, I think for those leaders, I can't imagine how frustrated they would be flying into Washington to have a conversation as NATO leaders gather with two wars taking place right now that the world are all looking at. One is in Ukraine and the other is in Gaza. The issue that I would have as a global leader would be of great disappointment that the only thing we're talking about is the health of the sitting president and whether he's going to remain in the election in November. And what time he's going to go to bed. I mean, these are not things that you necessarily want to be focused on where there are some very serious issues that they should be discussing. Coming up on this program, this is the lineup for you. We'll be catching up with Brent Schutte of Northwestern Mutual on recession risk. We'll catch up with Brent in just a moment. David Kelly of JP Morgan on why he's keeping an eye on the unemployment rate. We'll catch up with David in just a moment. We need to talk about these Delta numbers as well. Sort of price sensitivity starting to come to the surface. Delta down in the pre-market and down quite hard. Then we'll speak to Steve Rusciuto of Mizzoua reacting to today's inflation report out in about 25 minutes time. We begin with our top story. It is June CPI data at 8.30 Eastern. Brent Schutte of Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management saying this, it's a race to see which cracks first, inflation or the economy. And if it is inflation, can the Fed cut rates fast enough to keep what appears to be a weakening economic backdrop from pushing further down and ultimately into a recession? Brent joins us now for more. Brent, wonderful to catch up with you, buddy, as always. I'm going to ask you your own question. What cracks first, inflation or the labor market, the economy? I think, unfortunately, they crack together. And so to me, when you see these weakening CPI reports over the past few months, you have to think about what's happening behind the scenes. And you are seeing a weakening economy. You're seeing the services side of the economy, importantly, come down quite a bit. You've seen the ISM services negative two of the last three months. You mentioned Delta in the pre-market. Look, things are moving uh, lower in the economy, and historically, the Fed has been able to cut rates before the recession actually occurs, but it hasn't stopped it from occurring. And I don't think this time is going to be anything different. And I'm really interested in those jobless claims because, as you mentioned in your opening, the labor market has weakened quite a bit, and it's a confusing stew. But if you look at it, the unemployment rate is up seven-tenths from its low. The SOM rule, which we all talk about all the time now, is one-tenth from hitting. And 22 states have actually already violated it, which has never occurred without a recession occurring. Brent, if we trigger the SOM rule, I'm really intrigued by this question. I don't hear the urgency in the communication coming from the Federal Reserve around this issue. I don't hear it from Claudia SOM herself. Brent, I hear it from market participants. How do you think market participants, how will markets respond to that data if we climb another, say, 10 basis points on unemployment? Yeah, we're, we seem to be in a period of suspended disbelief where investors don't believe things that have worked in the past will work again because they haven't so far yet. And so if you think about LAI, you think about all the different indicators over the past few months that have pointed to recession that haven't worked yet, I think many people are shrugging them off like they do at the end of every economic cycle that I've lived through. And so to me, it's a normal behavior that we're seeing what we're seeing. Uh, and that's where I think there's a, a bit of a risk because I think investors have largely ignored, ignored those signals. And I don't think it's so odd that they haven't worked this time. I think it's just taking longer because the consumer businesses were so filled with excess savings and had pretty much steadied themselves against rising interest rates. To me, the longer rates remain higher, the greater the risk of recession as the lagged impact of those rates continue to work their way into the economy. And I think you're seeing that in the low end consumer, you're seeing that in some weaker parts of the economy, and now it's seeping up into the higher end and even into the services side, which has been holding up the US economy for the past you know, two years. At a time of confusion around which metrics to actually look at and which are actually still accurate, Mohamed al has come on this program and said, just listen to what the companies are actually saying. We got three earnings reports so far this morning. We got Pepsi, we got Delta, 
and we got Conagra, which is the uh, the brand that also has Slim Jim and uh, Orville Redenbacher and other sorts of uh, common consumer brands. Is this a signal to you that this is just a margin compression story or this is a true concern about consumer appetite and willingness to keep spending? I think it's each. And so to me, if you see consumers, they're, they're hurting a bit, especially at the lower income levels where credit card delinquencies flows into those are at levels that exceed the past two recessions. Uh, and so you're seeing it there. And you're also seeing margin compression because companies can't raise prices as much. At the same time, compensation is still elevated. Yes, it's come down like Chair Powell talks about, but it's still not where it needs to be for inflation to be sustainably at 2%. And that's where I think the issue is on both of those metrics. And that's where I think markets are in for a bit of a, a, a awakening in the next couple of months. You wrote uh, that there are a lot of hopes baked into equity markets that need to pull back in the shorter term before we get more interested in large caps again, kind of speaking to some of the over enthusiasm that you're seeing, at least in markets. Can you quantify that? Give us a sense of how much of a pullback and where you would need to see it to once again re-engage with the market? Yeah, it's not that we're out on the market. And actually, my, my positioning is a bit interesting, given my outlook. Look, I think there are parts of the market that have actually already discounted some sort of recession. And so if you look at the S&P 600, it trades at 8.1 times the trailing 12-month cash flow. If I go back in the last 26 years, the only time it's traded there is coming out of a recession. And so to me, this is where it's interesting. And Lisa, we used to talk about risk on, risk off on the show when I came on. And risk off meant buy bonds, risk on meant buy stocks. Today, risk off means buy the MAG7, risk on means buy the other 494 companies plus the mid cap and small cap sector. And so to me, I think investors have already discounted that. They've been hiding away in quality where earnings have actually grown. I think the biggest question going forward is how much do you pay for the MAG7 and can those earnings grow forever, which I think is a question that I've seen asked a few times in my history of doing this. And I think the answer is probably likely to be not. And so I think there are opportunities and things that are ironically economically sensitive. Doesn't mean they won't go down, uh, but I do think there are opportunities for investors that I steward, which are more intermediate to long term focused, to focus on those areas of the market that are underloved right now. Just to get some additional clarity, Brent, are you suggesting that this market is actually quite well priced for the economic downturn you're anticipating? No, I think there will still be a, a falter in the markets overall, because I think investors are similar to what they have been in the past, where they panic, even though they shouldn't and they know they shouldn't. But I do think if you think about 1999, you take a look at those charts under Bloomberg, um, small cap and mid cap actually did OK going into that recession. It was the stocks that had been bent up on the belief that they were economically impervious and tied to some longer term investment theme that didn't do as well. And then coming out of the recession, the next five, six, seven years, those parts of the market that were underloved value stocks, small cap stocks, mid cap stocks actually performed quite well. Even the equal weighted S&P 500, which we have a position in, uh, performed quite well. And so I think there's good news to go along with the concerning news of a recession. Uh, and that's where I think um, I'm still optimistic longer term. It's just that I'm a little bit more cautious in the near term because I'm seeing evidence of investor over optimism. Yeah, this is the challenge I think a lot of investors have got right now, Brent. Should I position for the recovery to the recession we still haven't had? You know, what do you tell them if they ask you a question that sounds a little bit like that? I, I don't think you can time anything perfectly. I don't know when a recession is exactly going to happen. I do believe that we're later in a business cycle. I think the evidence there is pretty strong. I don't believe the Fed has ever taken an over uh, out of slack economy to a, a slack economy that has slack without unfortunately causing a recession because they do focus on the labing, la lagging labor market indicator. And so to me, I, I don't I do believe there will be a downturn. I don't think you're going to be able to time it perfectly. And so that's why I want to continue to own those things that are economically sensitive that haven't done as well, because I believe the opportunity set on the opposite side of this is so large that I don't want to miss it. Got it. Brent, appreciate the clarity. Thank you, sir. Brent Shuddy there of Northwestern Mutual. Some similarities in that conversation between what Brent said and what we heard a little bit earlier this morning from Russ Kostrick of BlackRock, which is I want to be in equities kind of for what the same reasons that Brent just described. But ultimately, where do I want to trim? Some of the high flyers, some of the big names, and we know what those names are. Even if in the short term there might be an underperformance of some of the other 493 stocks, there is this feeling that they have more upside than some of the Magnificent Seven, especially if the Federal Reserve cuts rates and allows them to borrow at more reasonable prices. And that's some of the thesis that we're hearing in an increasing number of guests. Down to cares about the economy, and NVIDIA doesn't. That seems to be the, the conclusion. What Brent said there, the question he's asking, is that a mistake? Is that a mistake? If you go down into an economic downturn, just how economic sensitive are these so-called secular growth themes? Do we find out they're more sensitive than some people thought they were? 
We will if we find out that artificial intelligence isn't necessarily applicable in this sort of quick and easy way that actually is a game changer across a swath of companies. Yes, maybe in some, but if it's not in the same kind of game changing way quickly in the others, it might be more sensitive just in terms of how far that demand can go. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity futures slightly softer. We're down a tenth of 1%. In 16 minutes' time, we get CPI data in America. Before we get to all of that, let's get you an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg brief. It's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The Biden administration is taking more steps to support, to support the American EV industry. The White House is awarding $1.7 billion to at-risk or closed audio manufacturing and assembly facilities across eight states. The plants would then be converted to support clean vehicle manufacturing. Stellantis plant in Illinois and GM plants in Michigan are two locations, each set to receive over $500 million. The wards are subject to negotiations and other reviews before becoming final. And a check on PepsiCo shares in the pre-market this morning, down by nearly 2%. It reported second quarter profit that beat expectations, yet revenue did come up shy. Organic revenue in the second quarter rose 1.9% versus a 2.9% estimate. Demand is slipping after consistent price raises from PepsiCo, especially in North America, where revenue and volumes dropped year over year. Prices for the most in-demand luxury watches slipped on the secondary market last month, extending a two-year decline. The Bloomberg Subdial Watch Index fell about 1% in June for a total decline of 8% over a year. Bad news for speculators who had been snapping up watches, betting that it could beat other asset classes. Yet the S&P, for its part, is up 27% over the same time period of the past 12 months. The only brand to have gained among the 50 most traded watches in the second-hand market was Cartier, up 2% in a year. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. If I had a Patek or an AP, I'm not sure I'd wear that in public in New York City. You see some <laughs> of the thefts taking place. I've, I've heard about this, and I've heard about how it's happening in a whole bunch of different places. It has been a problem and a lot of companies, a lot of, of restaurants are saying they're trying to install more security, more cameras. How do you even protect your staff, some of whom have been injured during some of these thefts? Yeah, it's kind of shocking arriving on mopeds, seeing it outside the restaurant, seeing some thefts taking place inside the restaurant as well. As part of that story there, I want to talk about this one just briefly. Delta's getting hammered, like absolutely hammered in the pre-market. We're down by 9%. It's spilling over to the rest of the industry. Look at the other carriers. Americans down almost five. United's down 4.7. This to me really highlights the question of, are we seeing cracks in the industry that arguably was supposed to benefit the most from the new trends, the post-pandemic experience economy at a time where those numbers have shown strength? Why are we not seeing the profitability? Is this the beginning of margin compression? Is this consumer pushback? Or is this just a matter of cost cutting around the board of the Paris Olympics? We'll keep following that story as people sort of question whether we should be going to Paris this summer. Is that what you're doing still? Well, I guess I just am trying to kind of put that together because I would think that more people would fly to Paris to see the Olympics. And then if they don't fly, to, then maybe it's a good time to it's go. It's an odd excuse. I mean, you know, that can't be the only reason. It's not the only reason. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I want to dig a little bit more into that. Dig deeper, Bram. Okay, well. Up next on the program, the morning calls, plus David Kelly of JP Morgan counting us down to CPI data in America. That data just around a corner. Here down to two things this morning. The opening bell one hour and ten minutes away, and in about ten minutes' time, we also get CPI data for you. Going into it, the scores look like this. In the equity market on the SP 500, we are down by two tenths of one percent. Yields are just about unchanged on a 10-year maturity, south of 430 at 428. 61. It's time now for some morning calls. First up, Rosenblatt Securities raising its price target on Broadcom to a street high of 2400 The analysts seeing strong prospects for the chip maker, including upside from ongoing AI trends. Your second call from Darden Restaurants cut to underperform at Jefferies with a price target of 124 The analysts saying the Olive Garden parent could lose share thanks to rising promotional intensity in the casual dining sector. We're down by 1.6% there. And finally, Baird raising its price target on Costco to 975 from 850 The analysts highlighting the chain's membership fee increases, providing more oxygen to support Costco's lead on foot traffic and market share gains. That stock is up by 2.4%.
June's inflation report is just around the corner. You all know that. Core CPI expected to rise 0.2% for the second month in a row, marking the smallest back-to-back -back gain since August. With us around the table, David Kelly of JP Morgan. David, good morning. It's good to see you. Glad to be here. 8.30 Eastern time. We're all looking for CPI. Maybe to come in a little bit softer, leave the door wide open for a September rate cut. Do you see things quite the same way? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I'm, I, it's a dangerous game to play this consensus game because we could easily miss by a tenth one way or the other. But overall, the year-over-year -year CPI inflation rate, we think will come down from 3.3% to 3.2%. And it's just a steady decline. I think it keeps on falling on a year-over-year -year basis until about September, and then it sort of stalls out a little bit. So it is coming down, but it is, as you know, we've talked about for a long time, just coming down slowly. Um, so that's one part of the story. The other part of the story is we are seeing a more notable shift down in the pace of consumer spending uh, growth. And so some of the data from the last few months on retail sales and on um, you know, auto sales, uh, some of the signs and for you know, credit card delinquencies, they are saying that consumer spending is growing more slowly. I think the Fed is looking at that too. So a little less inflation, but also a little less growth. So are you saying that the disappointments that we've seen in the forecast from Conagra, from Pepsi, from Delta, the sort of downgrade of Darden companies, the idea that maybe the breadsticks aren't really doing it at all of Garden, there's this question of whether that alone should be sufficient, in your view, for the Fed to cut rates and maybe even will be sufficient? Yeah, and I think, I think it will. I mean, first of all, last year, I seem to remember Chairman Powell saying, you know, if we've got um, inflation coming down towards 2%, um, even if the economy is, is still okay, we can cut rates, we can normalize rates. Now, we're not headed for, I don't see any reason why we should be headed for recession here, but we are seeing that slowdown in growth, we're seeing inflation. You know, if we, this number today should be consistent with a 2.5% year-over-year change in the consumption deflator. That's close enough to two, as far as I'm concerned, given the trend we're on here. So I think there's a perfect reason for the Federal Reserve to normalize rates, and I think he sort of hinted that, uh, at that in his testimony this week. When you say normal, what is normal in this particular regime? What does that I, look like? I think normal is higher than the Fed says. The Fed says that in the long run, the, the federal funds rate ought to be at 2.8%. I think it's higher than that. I think you, you, you take that 2% that inflation rate, you add on close to two percentage points, so you get to about a 4% Fed funds rate, 375 to 4. I think that's, that's reasonable. So that, to me, that's normal. And what's happened is right now we've got a restrictive monetary policy, um, which is you know, not doing that much to the economy, but it is kind of messing up financial markets and, and adding some risk to, the, to certain parts of financial markets. So I think just normalizing back down to 4% and then holding until the, until the Fed actually has to do something one way or the other would be the right way to go. Equity markets at all-time highs going into this print in about seven minutes' time. Mike McKee's with us to break this one down. Mike, you're going to break down the number when it drops. Give us the preview. What are you focused on? And what do you think Chairman Powell needs to see in this particular print to gain that additional confidence he needs, the committee needs, to reduce interest? interest rates? Well, it's unlikely that we're going to get a, a huge downside move. But if we do get the slight downside move that economists are forecasting, that'll keep the Fed on the path to September. Within the report, they're going to be looking at the things that uh, have surprised in recent months. And of course, housing. Uh, housing, according to Omar Sharif of Inflation Insights, could come in at its lowest since 2021 uh, after uh, you know some months of waiting for this to actually happen. And then you want to look at airfares. I know you're talking about Delta and others this morning. And uh, insurance, that's been a big part of this, is what's happening to auto insurance and home insurance. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens post-hurricane with home insurance. But right now, it looks like um, we're seeing a, a sort of reversal of trend. Mike, which is more important, jobless claims or CPI? CPI. Uh, okay. Jobless claims is, is a great contemporaneous indicator, gives us an idea of where we are, but it doesn't necessarily tell us uh, how good or bad the labor market is other than in broad general terms. But CPI is going to give the Fed actual clues to where inflation is and probably where it's going. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Mike's going to be back with us in about five minutes. Great question. Great question. Oh, because some people out there might have a different opinion on that. It might be the labor market taking center stage. It depends what the numbers are. If CPI comes in line and all of a sudden jobless claims goes to 280, all of a sudden you'll have a very different point about which was the more important number. And I think that that is the balance that people are kind of making. What did City say? Danger zone was something like north of 260? Exactly. And something like that. We're creeping toward that. The estimate for today, 235. The previous week, 238. The numbers drop in just a moment. CPI is just around the corner.
the latest inflation read in America together with those jobless claims numbers. To break it down, Mike McKee, Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho, and David Kelly of JP Morgan Asset Management. Fantastic lineup to react to the latest big economic data point in the United States of America. That data drops next. The economic data just around the corner. It is 20 seconds away. Jobless claims, CPI, and a whole lot more to focus on. Mike McKee's going to break it down. These are the scores going into the data. We're down by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500 in the bond market. Yields on a two-year, 10-year, 30-year look a little something like that. Two's unchanged, 462. Right now looking at tens, 426.65 with the data. Here's Mike McKee. Well, John, good morning. And it looks like we are remaining on the path to September. CPI headline comes in down a tenth of a percent. The forecast was it would go up by a tenth. And core comes in up just one tenth. The forecast two tenths. So some real progress there on CPI. The Fed is going to be glad to see on a year over year basis, the uh, CPI is at three percent. And the uh, core is at 3.3%. So a lot of uh, good news in the inflation headline numbers. In terms of jobless claims, 222. We go the other way. <laughs> Instead of the crisis uh, level, we're going back to uh, where we used to be. Continuing claims, 1,852,000. So uh, I'll take a look at the underlying data, and uh, I'm sure you're getting a market reaction today. Yeah, you can guess in which direction. Mike, thanks for that. Mike, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Double-digit decline at the front end of the yield curve. So let's talk about that. A double-digit basis point decline. We're down 11 basis points on a two-year. We're back to 450. On a 10-year, we're down 10 basis points. It's a break of 420 at 418. Once you've seen moves like that in the bond market, you know what happens when you push it through foreign exchange. You've got a weaker dollar, a stronger euro. And I think you can guess where equities are right now. Let's check it out. The S&P 500, the Nasdaq, firmer, the winner, the outperformance from the Russell up by 1.3%. Lisa, based on this data, and we can talk about whether we should extrapolate it out through the rest of the year or not in a moment. But based on this data this morning, it's the best of both worlds. Jobless claims come in a little bit better. Downside surprise on CPI. Is it Goldilocks redux? That's kind of what I was thinking when I was looking at this, given the fact that jobless claims went in the opposite direction. I will say that the previous week was revised upward by uh, 1,000. Not anything dramatic, though. This, that said, how much can you really glean Goldilocks from something that is just like a blip in the moment. At the same time, you could see how it's being translated to the market. If the Fed cuts now, it would be a dovish cut. It would be a positive kind of view on a market, a mid-cycle adjustment that would allow equities to keep rallying. That seems to be the tone. That's the kind of rate cut the equity bulls want to see. Mike McKee, I'm going to come back to you and use the words of Chairman Powell. Repeat them again. The question is, are we sufficiently confident that it is moving sustainably down to 2%? I'm not prepared to say that just yet. After these numbers, would he be prepared to say that? He might be. It'll be a lot harder to say that we've got a lot more work to do, given uh, the way some of these numbers are breaking down. Of course, we saw a big drop in gasoline prices. That continues. And we've seen oil prices go down, uh, especially with the IAEA report. And that is a big part of what all this is. But the biggest thing is housing. And housing has finally gotten into the area the Fed has been expecting for a long time. Owner's equivalent rent up just three-tenths. That is the lowest since the fall of 2021. Uh, rent of shelter up just two-tenths of a percent. Rent of primary residence three-tenths. So a lot of good news there. We also see that lodging away from home fell by 2%. It's interesting because this is the time of year when you know, the, the tourist places like where I am would be full. And uh, so lodging, it, it was a little bit of a surprise coming down in June by that much. Uh, I'm still looking here for, to see uh, motor vehicle insurance uh, is what I'm trying to get to here because that's uh, a big deal. New cars and trucks prices, uh, new cars down by uh, four tenths and used cars down by one and a half percent. So all of that continues to be the kind of thing uh, that 
uh, we're looking for. Mike, I find it fascinating that when you look at the uh, futures markets, you actually see the, the chance of a September rate cut go down after these numbers came out, that it was actually higher yesterday at almost 75 percent. Today, it's below 70 percent in the wake of these numbers. How much, if the doesn't seem like the labor market is cracking, how much will patience be the operative word for the Federal Reserve, even at a time where inflation is coming steadily down? Well, you have to think that uh, they are not going to rush into it. And, and uh, my guess is they would not rush into July. Uh, but uh, we could get a really soft PCE print. And then you want to look at what happens with the spending numbers, retail sales next week and uh, PCE spending at the end of the month. And if they get an indication that the economy were, was cracking, then they might go in July. But this really sets up the opportunity for them to start talking about September, getting the market priced for that, and uh, basically saying we're on the path if the economy continues to develop uh, the way we think it is and the way uh, that we're seeing. Jobless claims today don't give any indication that we're going to see any kind of uh, major drop off in the economy, though. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Mike, we'll come back to you in about 10 minutes time. Stay close. If you are just joining us, we'll start with the data and then we'll bring you the price action, the reaction to that economic data. We'll start with headline inflation month over month, CPI coming in at negative 0.1 percent. The survey, the meet and estimate in our survey here at Bloomberg, positive 0.1. So that's the right kind of downside surprise. Stripping out food and energy month over month, we come in at 0.1. The survey, we were looking for positive 0.2. That's the economic data for CPI for jobless claims. We were looking for 235. That came in with the right kind of downside surprise at 222. So the jobless claim picture, a little bit healthier. The inflation picture, leaving the door wide open for this Federal Reserve to consider making a move. So you can guess what's happening in financial markets. We'll start with equities, then turn to bonds and go to foreign exchange. Equities rallying, futures up by two tenths. We've had seven days of gains on the S&P 500 already. The longest daily winning streak of the year so far. We might add some weight to it. And the Russell, Lisa, that's where your outperformance is. The Russell, the small caps, up by close to 2%. In early trading. And this is exactly what Brett Schutte was talking about, that essentially if you get some sort of cooling in the economy in any kind of way, those rate cuts are going to bolster the areas of the market that haven't necessarily seen some of the gains to date in, uh, that, that have been commensurate with what we've seen in big tech. Look, it's just one set of data, but this would talk about the soft landing that Fed Chair Jay Powell says that he stays up at night worrying about landing. This is what they want to see. Do they see a rate cut as helping perpetuate this type of dynamic? Push it through the bond market, 10 basis point move at the front end, the two years down to about 452, the 10 year earlier break in 420. We're at about 419 right now. We're down nine basis points on a 10 year yield. You push that through foreign exchange. We talked about this briefly. You've got a weaker dollar against a stronger Euro. Euro dollar looks a little something like this. We are firmer on that currency pair, close to 109, positive by four tenths of 1%. With us around the table, Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho, still with us, David Kelly of JP Morgan Asset Management. David, just got this from Neil Dutta of Renmac. The doves have what they need. It's time to cut. Get on with it. Do you agree? Uh, no, I think they should go in September. I, I, would, uh, I, I think they just need to be steady as they do this, because if they rush it, it's going to actually look like they're scared about something. And uh, I mean, I don't think they should have gone this high in the first place, but now they're here, just let's take it down easily. So I still think September, December, March, June, September, December. Six rate cuts, one and a half years, I think that's what they should do. Powell in Central Portugal said a strong labour market gives them some time, the luxury of time. Do you think he has that time as well? Uh, I th yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, there, there could be some cracks in private credit, there could be some cracks in regional banks. I mean, we are concerned about things that are not set up for normal interest rates. But remember, long-term interest rates are kind of at normal levels here. A normal business ought to be able to operate here. So I, th I think it's, um, you know, if it slows the economy a little bit by, by not accelerating this, okay. But I, I, I would rather they take their time and not, not rush this because once, once they start rushing rate cuts, then it's going to scare people. Steve, what's your impression? I know that you've been on the maybe they shouldn't cut at all. Uh, what about given how much inflation's come down? Again, you had a tra you've had an inflection point in the economy. We went from 3.3% last year with an economy that was clearly growing too strong and inflation was not going down. You had a shift to a slower growth economy this year, 2.2%, 2.3%. You've had some benefits of that in terms of a higher unemployment rate, a lower level of inflation. 
Is the economy going to stay a trend or is it going beyond that? That's now the question they have to answer. They also have to worry about the risk, because as David mentioned quite clearly, the concern is if they move too quickly, the expectation will set in the market could get ahead of themselves. You know, you've already seen one or two uh, strategists on the street saying they're going to cut rates eight times next year. So you've got this environment where if the market goes too far, they then have to think about, will they then have to reverse policy? So the dots have kind of put them in a bit of a tricky box for themselves. So they really can't do a, a, a hawkish cut. All they could do here is do a cut that fulfills the dots, and the markets are likely to go well beyond that. Okay, pause. This is something that people used to talk about. We have just gotten 37 record highs on the S&P 500 this year. Why is that not potentially problematic enough for them? Why is be. that welcome? You think it should be? It should be, but this is a different Fed. You have to take a look at the people at this Fed. These are a bunch of political economists. They're not the old school anti-inflation hawks. The political economists want to play with the levers. They've written their dissertations on playing with the levers. They want to play with the levers. They're going to play with the levers. We're not arguing about if, we're arguing about when and how the market will react to it. They think that they can control the market's behavior. And to a certain extent, they've done that. And they've gotten a great hand. Let's be honest. They're getting everything they want. The economy looks as if it's slowing. The labor market looks as if it's coming back to normal. Inflation looks as if it's coming down. To me, this is a winning hand. Why would you toss it out by doing something stupid in July? Well, they you wouldn't. You'd sit back and wait. The other thing about, you know, if there are parts of the markets which are over-exuberant, it is entirely the fault of the Federal Reserve for going 10 years with rates at zero. I mean, if you make the carrying cost of crazy zero, then people do crazy things. And, and so we saw that. We saw, then we got momentum going in Bitcoin and meme stocks and even the, the, the MAG7. And what's happening now is you've got a stable economy and people are just doubling down on the bets that have worked. But, you, but we want to see more fundamental investing rather than momentum investing, but they are really, they've sort of caused this momentum investing environment by keeping rates so low so long that you could get all these irrational bets going. And now the problem is, well, how do you get out of that? And I think you just return to rational interest rates, which makes sense based on the economic fundamentals. And then, and then over time, markets can re return to that rather than trying to manipulate markets by, by moving interest rates too quickly. Steve, what do you make of that argument, that essentially if they adjust policy that will help some of the names that haven't participated in the euphoria? We're seeing Russell 2000, which is underperformed, actually outperforming at rate-cutting expectations, not necessarily NVIDIA. I think there has been an environment in here in which basically the underperformance has been a function of the fact that earnings for a lot of these companies haven't been good. And the reason why earnings for a lot of these companies haven't been good is because their costs have gone up. And not only that, because of the discount or the slower growth environment that we've seen coming into this year, it's harder for them to pass those prices on, so they're getting squeezed. The question is, what is the next reaction to it? I think the answer is if the Federal Reserve begins to cut interest rates and the market goes very aggressively, which I think the market will do, the market will overstate what the Fed is going to do because every time they cut, they go to zero. I guarantee you, as soon as they cut, you are going to see zero hedge and you're going to see a lot of news stories out there about there must be a collapse in the real estate market. There's something going on in the economy. The Fed knows something we don't know. We're going to be talking about zero levels of interest rates. Once that happens, they're going to be faced with a very different situation. This is why equity analysts have been unwilling to cut their earnings because they know that basically whenever the Fed cuts, they go to zero. So we're expecting them to cut, we're expecting them to go to zero. So why would I ever cut my earnings numbers? I'm going to have a real bullish economy. The, the, the most dangerous time for the economy is usually when the Federal Reserve decides they're going to help us. Is this the point that you're making, just on the timing, that they wouldn't go in July because it would spook people? Yes, I mean, I, I think that I think there, there is a cadence, to, you know, there, there are four big meetings where they put out new summary of economic projections and four smaller meetings where they don't. And I think a cadence of cutting rates at every as summary of economic projections meeting, so the September, December, it makes it predictable. And you also get down to look, our, our terminal rate here is, is essentially a normal rate of about 4% or so in the federal funds rate. That's where we're headed until the economy actually, need, or financial markets in the economy need us to do something. But they shouldn't try and micromanage the economy and because what they end up doing is causing bubbles and busts in, in, in asset prices. I'd like the view from both of you on the following question. Are there political considerations at play here? Do you think there are? I believe they try, they try very hard not to, uh, not to 
interact or make political decisions or overtly political decisions because they don't want to come back at them. You know, deep down, I know they prefer a government that lets them do their job because while I don't always agree with what they do, I think we would be infinitely worse if we had people from the other side of Washington telling them what to do. That would only make the situation much worse. So I'd much rather the Fed make mistakes, but they're honest mistakes they make on their own with the best intentions for the country rather than have the other side uh, of Washington make the decisions for them. Steve? Well, I think the answer is they want to maximize social welfare. We can argue as to the right way to maximize social welfare. The inflation hawks would say keep inflation at 2% on a sustained level and let the economy find its own equilibrium on the real growth side. This Federal Reserve, on the other hand, wants to maximize social welfare by keeping unemployment very, very low. There's a big difference in the fundamental profile, and that's the reason why I'm sitting here saying it's nuts if they cut interest rates. They run a lot of risk if they will cut interest rates, and they may have to reverse it down the road because they've created this instinctive response in the marketplace. But I also think you have to keep in mind, this Federal Reserve has been itching to cut rates. I think they'd be crazy to go in July. I think it's an open issue as to whether or not we could talk about September. It's always been about not if, but when. And we'll see what the data shows us between now and then. So what you're just saying is that essentially the most important number for them is the employment number, not necessarily the inflation number. Is that correct? They don't want to see a rise in unemployment. No, they don't want to see it. Keep in mind, the rise in unemployment we've had today goes back to something David said earlier, which is basically the household employment is dipping and the payroll employment no, it isn't. The reality is, whenever you re-benchmark these two series, guess what? It's the household employment that's adjusted to payroll. So the payroll is the better coincident indicator of what's happening. So you've had a dip down in household employment, you've had an increase in the participation rate, and the unemployment rate has gone up. You've had very few layoffs, according to that same household survey. So you actually have an environment in here in which people aren't losing their jobs. So to me, the labor market is actually still tighter, and that is what they're paying attention to. Well, I, I think, it's, a, I think it's, a, it's almost like we've seen a, a microeconomic change in the, in the labor market rather than a macroeconomic change. Because if you go back to when we hit a trough back in April of 23, you, if you could fog a mirror, you got a job. And frankly, there are a lot of people in America who shouldn't be employed. Um, and what's happened is, if you look at what's actually happened with the unemployment numbers um, the, uh, the, from the household survey, it's the long-term unemployed that have gone up. There are, and that's really interesting in an economy where you've got 8 million job openings. There are people who, after 15 weeks, after 26 weeks, cannot find a job. That's not about the economy. That's about the, you know, are these people employable? And so I think what's happened is we've actually, I think Chairman Powell's right, we have actually returned to a kind of normal labor market at 4.1% unemployment. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it's a sign of great macroeconomic weakness. I would take issue with one thing, though. I am concerned that the payroll survey may be overestimating things because when I look at business formation data, it's suggesting that we're creating all these businesses. And if that's feeding into their births debts model, they may be getting that a little bit wrong because I think, I think there's a lot of churn in businesses. I don't think this is meant as much business, new business creation as some of the data would suggest. just want to uh, offer this up. Fed funds futures have just readjusted to about 85% chance of September. Yeah, so. so that sounds like it's a bit more in line with what I would expect, uh, given what we're seeing. I'm curious, Steve, given what you're talking about, how you would see some of the earnings that we got today that indicated a real reduction in consumer spending and definitely less pricing power more broadly. I think it, it indicated more the less broader pricing power environment. But again, we're still running an inflation rate well above 2%, even with these numbers. So we're still a percentage point above. And if we're going to say, oh, gee, the deceleration from 3% to 2% is a big movement on growth, okay, the movement from 3% to 2% on inflation has to be considered a big movement still. So we're still you know, in that environment. So I think that the reality is when we balance it and we look back at the data in general, we take a look. They're still well above their target on inflation and they're still maybe at trend growth. Okay, where do we go from here? I, I think the reality is that you're seeing an environment where cost pressures are squeezing companies. And that's really their problem. And they will, if you cut interest rates and you have a sharp rebound in economic activity, they will pass those price increases along. And when that happens, then it becomes a problem for them. This is why go slow, take your time, you've got a winning hand. Why would you do anything today or potentially September to destroy that winning hand? It yeah. makes no sense to me. I just wanted to know if Fog and Mirrors was on the job description at JP Morgan. That's all <laughs> well, I want to know now. I wanted to know what he was talking about. Is it that you get close to it and go, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. This, that's <laughs> how you check if something's <laughs> actually about <laughs> the living. <laughs> okay, right, okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay, thank you. Catch up. Thank you, I'm just trying. Just open no new hearts of JP Morgan and watching. David Shudder of Mizzou, David Kelly of JP Morgan, to the both of you, thank you. Jen's just fantastic. Agreeing on something as well for once, too. They can wait. They can wait. Mike McKee's still with us. Mike, I wanted to return to you just because you've had a few more minutes to go over this data. What jumps out for you now? Well, there are a number of numbers that jump out, but I think the overall thing that is uh, very interesting about this report is how calm so many categories are. Uh, it does show kind of a normal inflation, pro the kind of normal inflation that we had prior to the pandemic. A lot of things uh, up a tenth or down a tenth, uh, not, so, not so many huge moves. The biggest thing now is rent because of course it's 30% of the CPI, the owner's equivalent rent up just three tenths. That's uh, low from the fall of 2021. So uh, some real progress there. The Fed finally seeing what it wants to see. Food prices up just a tenth, apparel prices up just a tenth, uh, airfares down 5%. You can see Delta was getting ahead of the CPI with that uh, release that it, it put out. But used cars were down a lot, new cars were down a lot. Uh, automobile insurance, the one thing that rebounded from last month's drop was up nine tenths. So uh, basically it's a very benign inflation report. And because it's broadly benign, I think that gives the Fed a little more confidence that uh, inflation is going to remain under control because uh, it's just a, a, the whole process is coming out uh, as it used to. And this bond market rallying quite hard off the back of it, yields dropping. Mike, thank you, sir. Mike McKee there, breaking down CPI, the inflation data and jobless claims as well. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Let's do that and get the Blimbo Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John, I do just want to go over those figures one more time. Both core and headline CPI coming in softer on the month. That has sent money market odds for September cut to over 80% and the front end of the curve, as you mentioned, John, to its lowest since March. The 3.3% annual gain in the core reading is its smallest since April 2021. Only four of the 71 economists surveyed had predicted that the core monthly gain would come in at 0.1%. Everybody else was higher. As for the individual components, Mike mentioned some of these, but used cars down 1.5%, hotels down 2%, and airfares tumbled by 5%. Elsewhere, Citadel Securities is crafting a new plan to handle even more of Wall Street's trading, according to people with direct knowledge of the matter. The firm aims to offer a white-label trading service where it manages the guts of a trading desk like the technology analytics and order execution. That would allow struggling banks and brokerages to just focus on dealing with customers. The plan is still in its early stages, according to those people familiar, and could still evolve. Now, shares of the major U.S. airlines all falling in sympathy with Delta pre-market, down by as much as 5%, down by 9% for Delta after they forecast a quarterly profit that fell short of Wall Street estimates. The weaker forecast reflects issues that are plaguing the broader industry. Despite a busy summer travel season, the supply of seats available now exceeds demand, prompting some rivals to lower fares to stay competitive. Delta CEO Ed Bastian saying that price cuts have been, quote, particularly acute for June through August. And that's your brief, John. Hey, Danny, thank you. Appreciate it. Up next on the program, setting you up for the day ahead from New York. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Equity futures look like this, slightly softer now. Those gains don't stick on the S&P 500. They do on the Russell. The small caps up by almost 2%. Bonds still running and yields lower by double digit basis points. At the front end, we're down 10 basis points on a two year, 452. Inflation a bit softer. Jobless claims looking better too. As we count you down to the opening bell, here's the trading diary for the rest of this week. Later on, President Biden set to hold a news conference when the NATO summit ends at 5.30 Eastern. Friday brings US PPI and new Mitch. Plus, we get some bank earnings, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citi. Looking ahead to that press conference in the room, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. AMH, tee it up for us. What are you focused on? Well, it feels very make or break, and this is going to be kind of like the debate, what's more important, style or substance? This is going to be style. Is the president answering clearly? Is he stringing along sentences and not mumbling? How does he act? And how many questions does he take? 
everyone is going to be putting this president under a microscope. It feels very make or break for this White House, especially given the fact that yesterday we had one voice come out, first sitting U.S. Senator Peter Welch of Vermont, saying he needs to step aside. You'll be in the room. You'll be asking questions, too. Is this going to be about his health or will we actually ask questions about NATO, about the wars taking place around the world? Well, I'm hoping I get a question. It depends how many questions Biden and his team is willing to give out. Is this just going to be very structured, maybe two journalists that he's going to call on? Or is he going to do what he did when he marked the one year anniversary of his administration and do a two hour news conference? Anne Marie, down in Washington, looking forward to the coverage a little bit later. What a morning, what a day we've got ahead. Coming up tomorrow to react, Gerard Cassidy of RBC, John Stolfus of Oppenheimer, the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, and a good friend of this program, Mohammed Al Arian. All of that still to come from New York City with softer inflation. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.